Faith Radio. And some might be thinking, you know, it's too much. He will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him and they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. First Enoch chapter 48 verses four through five. The modern world doesn't acknowledge but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Good evening, giant killers, dragon slayers, and um, exterminators of locusts. You're listening to the Lord of Spirits podcast. My co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung, is with me from the sweltering and highly humid Lafayette, Louisiana, and I'm here in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, cool and clean, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm Father Andrew Stephen Damick. Tonight, we're not taking any calls because, once again, this is a pre-recorded episode. God willing, we will be live with you again for our next episode. Father Stephen and I are pre-recording because we are, when you hear this, when it premieres, both in an apocalyptic location, also known as Phoenix, Arizona. Based on recent temperatures, it might well be a gateway to the underworld. What do you think? Write in, let us know. That said, we're not going to the underworld tonight. At least, I hope not. Pray for our repentance. Tonight, we're continuing our series on eschatology, talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Gog and Magog, and the armies of locusts from the north. Yes, it's Enemies of God Night on the Lord of Spirits podcast, so set your GPS for Armageddon. So my first question is whether the four horsemen were doing real wrestling or not. Yes. Is that different from wrestling? I guess wrestling, wrestling, pro wrestling, like are these different things? Well, see, here's the thing. I Greco-Roman wrestling? Even at his even at his present age, I would not accuse Ric Flair of not being real. <laughs> <laughs> not just in terms of the wrestling, but in terms of like his insane lifestyle and hmm. behavior. He's been getting real. He keeps it real. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. And even when keeping it real goes wrong, Ric Flair keeps it real. <laughs> that doesn't seem like it's to his credit. <laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah, right. That's, yeah, exactly. Um, but I think he successfully made it to such an advanced age, shockingly, <laughs> uh, that <laughs> given said lifestyle that he's kind of in that category now of like really old person where they could say and do horrible things and you're just kind of like ah yeah you know he's from another time yeah yeah i mean he's he's 74 now 74 yeah. this guy was born in 1949 yep that's amazing yeah and he had a he he sort of had a wrestling match last year he's been married five times sort of <laughs> wow he sort of did Five times. <clears throat> so God love him. But uh yeah, there there there's also a four horse women of MMA and a four horse women of the WWE. Oh. See, I didn't know any about anything of that. Yes. So there's there, there's far more to this. You you opened uh Pandora's jar on this one. Uh and yes, she had a jar. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Read a Car book. Cardboard anyway. box or <laughs> <laughs> it's a jar. Um 
that's not even like a Mandela effect. That's just nobody reads the original. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, it's also probably good since you declared it to be enemies of God night on Lord of Spirits that no one can call in. <laughs> I didn't think of it that way, but now now that you've said that. Because, yeah, we would have probably gotten some interesting calls. <laughs> Hopefully no enemies of God enemies would have actually God. called. Like James Earl Jones or... Oh! Wow. Uh, he went straight for the James Earl Jones. Yes, yeah. Or uh, the guy who invented Bit O Honey. Wow. I'm taking it you're not what? a fan of Bit O' Honey. No one is a fan of Bit O' Honey. I'm not. I, it's like Circus Peanuts. I, I don't mind. Actually, I don't mind Circus Peanuts. But to me, Bit O' Honey is like, it, it's it's like uh, candy corn and Tootsie Rolls and, I don't know, something peanut flavored all failing together. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But even 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 you, the you, you, the best endorsement you could give to Circus Peanuts was a combination of not as bad as Bitto Honey <laughs> and <laughs> wow. I could tolerate them. Wow. Like, no one is enthusiastic about Circus Peanuts. It's amazing. I mean, we're five minutes into our recording and already we've gone through pro wrestling and now we're at, you know, garbagey candy. Candy no one likes. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So that being said, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? This shows up in, uh, in the book of Revelation. Um, people have this idea, you know, that there's, there's war, there's famine, there's pestilence, there's death, right? These, and and, and yeah. you would think if you turn to the book of Revelation, you would see this list, and here's their names, right? Um, but that's not, not what really game. happens in there, actually. If you actually read it, so we're gonna we're gonna read it. Yes. So, but there's a little uh, bit of a little bit that comes before it, right? You have to, there's some frame that comes before Revelation six, which is where the four horsemen are mentioned. Right, right. Wrestling aside, uh, the best my, my vote for best modern rendition of the biblical four horsemen of the apocalypse was uh, Good Omens. Oh, I haven't seen that. Where they're they're uh, well, you could have read the book, mm. but uh, where they're uh, motorcyclists. Oh, there was Marvel Comics. I mean, um, Apocalypse. You know, he had his four horsemen. He turned angel yes. into archangel. I know, and and you know, Walt Simonson's great, but Apocalypse is the most disappointing villain ever. <laughs> like years of buildup. The dude is named Apocalypse. Right. Right ancient egyptian mutant right you think this guy's gonna be awesome and then they finally face off with him and like he turns his fists into giant hammers uh, and I know. tries to hammer them yeah which that was a sandman like, thing ser yeah seriously bro like uh, that that's what you got but angel or archangel was a kind of a nice little legacy from that yeah but half rate yeah. like half rate juggernaut like <laughs> seriously it's true i hear you seriously I hear you. Anyway, Bible itself. All right, so <clears throat> the four horsemen are in uh, Revelation chapter 6. And uh, to kind of set up what's going on, though, we have to dip a little bit back into chapter 5. Yeah. Um, so the, the four horsemen show up, make their appearance in the context of the opening of the seven seals. So there's this, in Revelation 5, there's this scroll in heaven. The scroll is sealed with seven wax seals that have to be broken in order to open the scroll. And uh, first, there's sort of a, a liturgical ritual thing that happens in chapter 5 uh, to try to locate the one who is worthy to open the scroll, to break the seals and open the scroll. Uh, that person is ultimately determined to be the lamb who was slain, uh, who is going to then break these seals and uh, open the scroll. The scroll uh, is a representation of sort of the deed or the title, the ownership or the authority over creation, over the world, over the cosmos. 
Um, and this is why a worthy person needs to be found to, again, take possession of the creation, the created order, and to put it back in order, to restore justice to it. Yeah, I mean, this feeds into, it's the same theme as when Jesus is about to ascend and he says, all authority or all power in heaven and earth have been given to me. You know, I've, I've taken it back from the dark powers that usurped it. it. This is mine. So this is just another way of, of right. depicting that same kind of thing. Right. And remember, to, as we've talked about now several times on the show, uh, to judge is to put things back into the proper order that, that justice represents, right? So this taking of possession is also a judgment, right? It's a putting things back. Uh, the way they're supposed to be after a situation of injustice has prevailed uh, for some time and things are out of order and not the way that they should be. And so in chapter 6, as the Lamb opens the first four seals, breaks those first four seals, after each one, one of the four horsemen sort of appears. Yeah. Right? Um, and you get... Behold a lot in English translations. Yes. Behold, which in Greek is yeah. idou, right? Although I love <laughs> right, a, I right. love a good Greek. lo, lo. Yeah, yeah. And what this is all covering for is actually a word in uh, the Hebrew Bible, um, hene. And if you want to really irritate a Hebrew professor of any stripe uh, translate the word hine as behold <laughs> with a big exclamation point after it um, so it is related to one of the Hebrew verbs meaning to see which is why it gets translated as idu right this idea of like look um, but the idea uh, behind the word is that it's only quasi translatable. It's supposed to give it a sense give a sense of immediacy or suddenness or right, kind of a, a surprise twist, right? It's not totally dissimilar from how we use the word look in the sense of if you and I were talking and we were going back and forth and all of a sudden I said, Look. Right? I wouldn't be actually telling you to look at something. I would just be, it would be like to get your attention. Your attention, yeah. Like, hey. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, which, I mean, like in, uh, you know, in, in Old English, there's a word like this, which is what, which is the first word of a number of different poems, including Beowulf. And, I mean, it is the ancestor of our modern English word, what, but there's a lot of debate about how to translate the word, and it seems to be like, listen up. Pay attention, you know. Hey, uh, it's not just an interjection. It's 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 definitely a call for attention, right? Um, right, right. And, and um, yeah. So as each of the horsemen shows up, you get this behold, <laughs> right? Um, but it's trying to. You could almost translate it like boom, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. He opens the seal and boom, there's a, right, there's a rider on a horse, right? Um, you could do bada bing, bada boom, I guess. <laughs> or you you know, want the good old Victorian, hey presto. Yeah, yada, 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 <laughs> right, whatever. <laughs> um, however you want to do it, but that's, that's the idea, is this sense of immediacy. So it, it's not like he sees somebody riding up in the distance like they're coming from some place and, the, and then they show up, it's just bang there they are right? yeah yeah that where do they come uh, out of we don't know behold there was a white horse right right um so uh then the question is so who who are these guys who are popping up during these first four seals um because seals five six and seven are different and we're going to mention a little later seal five but it, there, there aren't seven horsemen of the apocalypse right this is four out of the seven seals um and as father andrew already mentioned you may have in your head based on old x-factor comics or 
good omens or some other thing war famine pestilence and death right as as the names of the four horsemen but actually in the text in revelation 6 only one of them is actually named only one of them is said to have a name yeah and that's death yeah um the other three not only aren't named but aren't even said to have a name necessarily Mm. right um so they're identified in the text based on the descriptions that saint john gives for each of them right the details of their description and when i say the details of their description it's not like he spends you know a longish paragraph giving all these details no we're talking about a a short relatively short sentence Right, where he gives a few details, but that are sufficient uh, for his audience to understand who and what he's talking about. Right, so we have received those names pestilence, uh, war, famine, and death. Um, We received the other three, other than death, through the Christian tradition. Right. Uh, but not from the text itself, but they're also, those aren't sort of random. Those aren't, well, this church father or that church father or this group of church fathers or even all the church fathers agree that this is who they are and that's why that's who they are. As we mentioned, uh, the imagery that St. John uses that we're going to go through here the the imagery he uses is imagery that's found not only in the cultures surrounding the Old and New Testaments, but also within the Old Testament tradition itself, right? Um, this is true in general of the Book of Revelation. Um, the well. So the biggest pe- reason people probably under- misunderstand the book of Revelation is that they're trying to interpret it based on uh, a recent newspaper <laughs> or news broadcast, I should say, I guess, or the Internet. Uh, but the second biggest reason why people uh, misinterpret the book of Revelation is that, by and large, we aren't familiar enough with the Old Testament, especially with the Old Testament prophetic books. Yeah, so we don't get the references. Right. So all uh, there are relatively things that look like relatively brief passing things to us when we're reading Revelation that were all that the original hearers needed to know exactly what St. John was talking about. Yeah, and I mean, like an example from our own time and day might be, you know, if you're if you're watching if you're watching a cartoon right and suddenly you know mickey mouse comes on the screen and walks off you know you immediately recognize mickey mouse you have some idea of who his character is where he kind of fits within the whole disney thing and and all that kind of stuff when he walks on you don't need to have it explained to you this is a mouse even though number one he, he in a lot of ways he doesn't look like a mouse uh he looks more human than mouseish um, you don't need to have that explained or, or even what his name is, right? Like you see him, you just know who he is. So, I mean, this is part of what St. John is doing is he's, he's putting up these characterizations so that the people of his time would say, oh, I recognize this guy. Right, right. Or if some character on a show rips their shirt open and they have another shirt on underneath that has their first initial. Yeah, yeah. We all know what that really big on the chest means. We all know this is a reference to Superman. Yeah. <laughs> right. Even if that initial is like a G or a B. Yeah. That that's on their chest. Yeah, and it, right. it invokes the whole Superman, not necessarily his story, although some cases, but like the idea of him, you know, the hero that's that's disguised and, and all this kind of stuff, you know. Right, right. Whereas if you had no idea who Superman was, you'd never heard of Superman and someone did that, you'd have no idea what it meant. Yeah. Yep. And you might come up with all kinds of weird potential interpretations, right? Because you didn't have the background yes, in terms of why they did that and what that represented, right? Um, so the context for 
all of Revelation, including the four horsemen, is first of all the rest of the scriptures, and then second after that, the world in which the scriptures were written. Right. Um, so that said, um, for a couple reasons, one of them being he is the guy who gets identified and named uh, in uh, the text of Revelation itself. We're going to actually start with death. Yeah, even though he's even the, though the fourth one. Yeah, He's the fourth and last one uh, to show up. Um, and so he shows up in uh, verses 7 and 8 of chapter 6. All right. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed, followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. You almost King james I know. I almost just followed after him, or followed with him. Yes, followed with you him. wanted to. I know. It's just that King James is the Bible in my head. <laughs> it is. What can I say? But is it the only Bible in your head? It's the original <sighs> well, Bible in your head. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's gotten a little muddled. So, um, so this one, right? Obviously, its writer's name was Death. That's pretty on the nose, right? We're told who this is. Uh, Hades is following, is following him, and. The imagery here is Hades as a dog or a beast or something that's that's following after the guy on the horse, right? Um, as if it were in a hunting party or something, right? Um, and notice that uh, they're given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence. That would be the other three, right? Um, that we're going to uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, so uh, that that would be the other reason why we're starting with the fourth one is that uh, death here kind of gives us some context for all four. Yeah, there's this it, sense that the other ones are instrumentalized by this one. Right. So in the Greek, right, the word for we have for death is thanatos. And of course, we also have Hades, the Greek word for which is Hades. Um, <laughs> Adis. <laughs> Adis. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, Hades is kind of obvious, right? Um, but. Uh, the, the sort of easy identification then to make would be, well, if if St. John is appealing to sort of elements and concepts in the broader culture uh, surrounding uh, the scriptures and surrounding his original hearers at the end of the first century, uh, then this would be a reference to maybe the Greek god Thanatos, there is a Greek god named Thanatos, and the Greek god Hades, right? Like maybe that's just the, he's making just this direct connection. Uh, the problem with that idea is that the way he here is describing Thanatos and Hades doesn't really match the concepts of Thanatos and Hades, the Greek gods. Yeah. Right? Such that it doesn't look like he's referring to those because those would give a very different impression than the one he's clearly trying to give in context. So uh, Thanatos is uh, or was the brother of uh, Hypnos. Hypnos is one of the gods of sleep. He's the god of like deep dreamless sleep, not the god of dreams. Not the god of hypnotism? Um, hmm? Not the god of hypnotism? No, though that is where the word comes from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I just um, wanted to check check if the etymology always tells us. No. Yeah. Well, sort of. Sort of, yeah. It's, it's related. It's a um, related concept, but yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you could definitely see how the concept of a deep, dreamless sleep and death are related, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Um, but that also, the reason we bring up hypnosis, the brother, and that connection there is that this also has to do with the type of death with, with which Thanatos is associated. Yeah, he's not just death in general. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, we have various depictions of death, um, whether it be a gothy teenage girl or a, uh, or the Grim Reaper, right. Or these different depictions and, uh, Thanatos was specifically the God who was associated with death in old age. Right. The idea of, you know, the death that comes to people like a deep, dreamless sleep at the end of their life when they're old and tired and full of years and surrounded by their families. And right. That's the kind of death that he represented. Right. He's sort of like the Grim Reaper in the dog meme, you know, where the dog asks him if he was a good boy. Um, this is like the that kind of death. Right. Um and in fact, this, unlike most gods of death in most cultures, Thanatos actually was worshipped. There were shrines and stuff to Thanatos uh, in uh, Greek and, and Roman areas. And that was because people would go and make offerings to Thanatos because that's the kind of death they wanted. Yeah, usually you wouldn't worship a death god because you kind of want to ward them off. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But this was... This was the kind of death you wanted, yeah. and everyone was kind of aware that they were mortal, except maybe the emperor. Um, and so, you know, this is this is the one you were looking for, right? Um, that definitely does not sound like the figure Saint John is describing in Revelation six. <laughs> no, <right? laughs> yeah, killing with the sword killing. and famine and pestilence and wild beasts, yes, and... right? Kind of the opposite, right? Yeah, that's violence. Uh, and, and Hades the same way, right? Hades is being depicted as sort of trailing after like this beast or something. And Hades was one of the the big three gods. Oh, yeah. In Greek religion. Along with Zeus and Poseidon. Right. Where they divided up the earth after they took care of the Titans and uh, their dad, Kronos, and Zeus became the ruler of the sky and therefore the surface of the earth that's under the sky. Hades got the underworld. Poseidon got the seas, right? Um, so uh, in the Greek understanding, Hades was definitely not some servant of Thanatos, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, if anything, the other way around, right? Right, right. Um so this this doesn't really match up. But if you go back to ancient Semitic religion, if you go back to Canaanite religion, Phoenician religion, uh, and you go to their god of death, who's named death, Moat, um, you find somebody who looks a lot more similar, <laughs> right? Um, because Moat was both the god of death who went around dealing death and he also ruled over the underworld as a sort of tyrant. Hmm. Um, and so he was after capturing, killing, right, enslaving everybody, right? Remember, he eats Baal in the Baal cycle. Um and so uh, this kind of idea that St. John is describing with death here is much closer to moat and that kind of idea of God. Moat is also often depicted as or with alongside of him some kind of beast or creature with a big open gaping maw that represents Sheol, the grave, the underworld. Yeah, right? the, the hell mouth. Who's sort of swallowing up his victims, right? Like he's chucking them in there, um, or sometimes he's just the one swallowing, like with Bale and the Bale cycle. Um, but also importantly, in terms of this description by Saint John, Moat also had a little retinue 
of gods. Right? He had an entourage <laughs> who traveled around with him. And uh, in the way that St. John sort of depicts the sword and famine and pestilence going out in front of death and sort of killing, right? Reaping souls or whatever, however you want to imagine it, right? And then him sort of collecting them up and feeding them to Hades, sort of how St. John is depicting this. That's very much in keeping with Moat, who had these other gods of pestilence and of famine uh, and of war with and around him, right? Who sort of fed him, fed him the living, right? So it seems pretty clear uh, that, and the way death is described helps us see this, that, that St. John is drawing on this earlier sort of Canaanite structures. Yeah, but he's, uh, he's writing in Greek, so he's going to use yes. Greek words <laughs> to describe. Right, know. right. Yeah. Uh, but as we're going to see in this section, this is true throughout Revelation, but in this section, there are a couple places where we'll especially see he's basically writing in Hebrew in Greek. Yeah, he's thinking in Hebrew, <laughs> and he's translating in his head, and he's writing it in, right. in Greek words. Right, and not just any Hebrew, but specifically the Hebrew of the Hebrew prophets. Yeah. Um, and, and we're going to see he's getting his depictions... Even though, spoilers, we're going to end up saying all four of the horsemen are moldy old Canaanite gods. <laughs> um, the, uh, um, the way he is thinking about them and presenting them in Revelation is filtered through the way they're presented in the prophetic literature of uh, the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, so he's not, not just... just pres presenting pagan gods he's presenting the bible's take on pagan gods right yeah right which of course as we've said before right is the correction right and the reinterpretation of what the pagans believed so um having now looked at at death sort of the last one will roll back a little bit We'll go back to the first of the four horsemen who comes out. Okay. Um, and uh, how he's depicted and then how we understand who he is based on uh, that depiction. All right. So for those keeping score at home, death came on a pale horse. Uh, and here we go. Revelation 6-2. And I looked and behold, boom, a white horse and its rider had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So, yeah, that last little bit there, conquering and to conquer, is uh, e exhibit A of what I was just talking about, of writing in Hebrew in Greek. <laughs> That's, um, so in Greek, that just sounds kind of weird. Um, you're using the same verb twice. Once in the infinitive, <laughs> right? Um, which isn't really a thing you would normally do in Greek. Like you wouldn't show up uh, for a meal and be like, I came here eating and to eat. <laughs> um, at least people would look at you odd if you did. <laughs> Unless you like to speak in King James, which yeah. <laughs> some of us sometimes do. Um. But even then, it would be weird. And I answered and said unto him. Yeah. But I don't think eating and to eat would even, <laughs> even in that level of English. I think in Elizabethan England, if you took the TARDIS back there, they'd look at you oddly if you said, <laughs> I came here eating and to eat. Um, now I'm going to start but, Googling through uh, uh, Shakespeare to see if they said stuff like see that. See if there are any <laughs> phrases like that. Yeah. Um, I'll be right back. Yeah, it has to be the exact same <laughs> verb twice. Okay. Um, but this is this is a normal grammatical construction in Hebrew. Yeah. Um, where you use a verb and then you put the same verb in the infinitive. It's called an infinitive absolute construction. Um, 
probably the most famous one of these in the Hebrew Bible, or most well known. I don't know that it's famous, um, but the most well known one is when God gives the command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, uh, well, the way it's usually translated in English is on the day on which you eat of it, or day, on the day in which you eat of it, uh, you will surely die. Yeah, right. Um, but what it literally says in the Hebrew is on the day on which you, you eat of it, dying you will die or dying to die, right? <laughs> like you'll die a death, um, <laughs> something like that. Um, and that's this same kind of construction hmm. and the idea surely is actually, or was actually a really good translation in the sense that it's kind of an emphatic. Yeah. You're idea. really going to die. Yeah. Like not, you know, OMG, I just died when I saw whatever, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> We should we should replace all these constructions with literally is what we should do. That would literally, be you will literally die. Now, <laughs> right? I will always see Rob Lowe in my head now, having watched yeah. uh, Parks and Recreation all the way through. <laughs> literally, I think there's yeah. not a single moment in that show when he uses literally that he that it's literally what the word that he he needs. Yeah, Spend and he came way. out literally to conquer. Right. <laughs> um. So, yeah, so that's the idea there. Is it's, it's this emphasis, right, this emphatic uh, idea uh, with the idiom. So uh, from the way this fellow is described, uh, it's, it's pretty well a lock to identify him with the figure of Reshef. And we've talked about before. And we have talked about uh, Reshef before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think a couple of times. Uh, I can't listen to myself, so I couldn't go check and be sure. <laughs> but um, Living your best chat in he, life. He is a, he is a prominent uh, figure uh, in uh, ancient Near Eastern religion, uh, shows up repeatedly in the Hebrew Bible, um, but right. We only get, as I mentioned, a couple of descriptors. We get that the horse is white, but we get that the rider has a bow and he conquers things. <laughs> right. Um, Ref Reshef, one of his primary titles that describe him in, in, the ancient literature is he's described as the horse rider. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, you know, it's the rider has a bow of all weapons, right? Um, and Reshef is always depicted as an archer. Hmm. Uh, the arrows element is critically important. Right to his whole the whole concept, um, and Reshef was in the ancient world a god of plague or pestilence. His name literally means one who burns, and that was connected with fevers, which of course was a symptom for the onset of uh, plagues and pestilences and contagious diseases. Um, Fevers are one of the signs of contagion. Um, and ancient people were stupid. But he was also a uh, god of war. And it's not always obvious to us, but in the ancient world especially, but probably still to this day, at least in many places, there's a very close connection between war and plague. Um we now know from the perspective of science that a lot of this has to do with issues of sanitation. Um, when you have an army camped out at war, that's a prime breeding ground for disease because you've taken a whole bunch of people from one place and brought them to another place and then put them in close, 
close quarters with not great sanitation in an ancient military camp. Uh, at the same time, a lot of ancient warfare was laying siege to cities. And so what you did when you laid siege to a city was you cut off supplies going in, you cut off sanitation going out. Uh, and so the people inside, both due to malnourishment affecting their immune systems and the sanitation issues caused by being under a siege, would have outbreaks of plague and disease within the city. And that's part of what would help break a lot of sieges. Right, it's just people would have to stay closed up in the walls and all die, or they would have to surrender. Um, so there was this this connection right between disease and warfare that allowed him to also be a god of war, a god whose uh, favor would be sought out by those going to war, or who would be who those going to war would want to target against their enemies instead of them. Yeah. Um, Reshef was so popular uh, that he gets assimilated beyond sort of his, his home base where he originates is in, uh, in the Levant. So in Canaan, uh, Phoenicia, uh, Aramea, Syria, Right. This is this is where Refish originally comes from, but he gets assimilated into Egyptian religion uh, and maintains his name and maintains his general appearance huh. uh, from West Semitic uh, religions, which is kind of unusual for Egypt. Uh, they continue to depict him as an Asiatic, which is what they called foreigners from the rest of the ancient Near East. Uh, he gets assimilated at least at Cyprus, into Apollo. So you get these early depictions of Apollo in Cyprus uh, where he has the arrows, and the arrows are said to bring plague. Um, he's referred to, or there's a reference in the Iliad, uh, in Book 1, lines 42 through 55, to Phoenician Apollo. Uh, which is apparently Homer's way of referring to Reshef, right? That as he sees him as a particular hypostasis, a particular localization of Apollo. Uh, he's, you know, being a Greek, seeing the correlation the opposite way from what it seems to have been historically. It seems Apollo seems to have been Greek uh, Reshef, more, more the other way around. But, um, and uh, in the treaty between Hannibal the Carthaginian general of the Phoenicians and uh, Philip of uh, Macedon, the king of Macedon. Uh, Apollo is one of the gods who is invoked as a witness to the treaty, uh, this Venetian Apollo, because he seemed to be a god who they both share, hmm. right? Uh, and so can both appeal to in some way. Um, so he, he is of some major significance. And so the imagery of Reshef as pestilence and his arrows then gets picked up in a bunch of places uh, in the Old Testament uh, to describe pestilence and plague. Um. So, for example, Deuteronomy 32, verses 23 and 24, uh, God says, I will pile evils upon them. My arrows will I exhaust on them. They will be wasted with hunger. They will be devoured by Reshef and Keteb the poisonous. Right? So this is God talking about his judgment against the wicked. And you can see here language. We're going to be coming back to this of him sort of letting Reshef and Keteb, who's another sort of plague God, sort of loose on them, right? Sort of sicking, <laughs> sicking Reshef on them uh, as part of that judgment. In uh, Psalm uh, 78 in the Hebrew, 77 in the Greek, verse 48, um, that psalm goes through and sort of meditates on the plagues on Egypt. Hmm. Uh, and so in that psalm, when it gets to describe the seventh plague in verse 48, it describes uh, 
God describes that plague as having given up the cattle to hail and the herds to the reshifs uh, to, to plague or to disease, right? It's sometimes translated in English, but the word there is literally the name of this, um, this spiritual being. Um, Habakkuk 3 verse 5 uh, describes Deber, who's another similar kind of uh, God of uh, famine and trouble, going before Yahweh and Reshef following behind, following after him. What Habakkuk is doing there in Habakkuk 3 is he's describing that kind of entourage or retinue that's usually attrib- attributed to Moat, right, where Moat has sort of these minions who go and do these things. Uh, and in Habakkuk, it's actually Yahweh who is in control of those minions. And again, that's an idea we'll come back to um, a little later. Um, in Psalm 76 in the Hebrew, uh, 75 in the Greek, verse 4, it's talking, God is talking there about putting an end to war and to battle. And he says that he's shattered the ref chefs of the bow. Um, and this is kind of typical, um, I know we've mentioned Mantu before, who's the, who was the Egyptian god of war, who was thought, said to be the right arm of Ray. And so when you read in the prophets, a lot of the prophecies in the Hebrew Bible against Egypt talk about God breaking the right arm of Egypt, right? And that's the idea of him, you know, being able to wreck their, their war god. Um, this is the same kind of thing, right? Reshef being this war god with a bow, right? It's saying God can snap him the way you, you know, snap a bow over your knee or something. Oh, it's it's uh, it's verse 3, by the way. I'm just checking. It's not verse oh, 4. Oh, verse 3? 76, 3, yeah. Well, that may be different in the Greek and the Hebrew. Oh, yeah, maybe that's true. The yeah. verse numbering in a lot of the Psalms is different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was funny. One of the earlier verses you mentioned, um, the one in uh, about the plague, it actually, it says, most translations give it as the thunderbolts to the flocks or something like that. But if you, you know, pull out your Strong's at Concordance or, or the Blue Letter Bible on the internet, you can see it says Reshef. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, Job 5, verse 7 uh, one of the descriptions of Job's afflictions talks about the sons of Reshef that fly through the air. That's sort of the image of, right, the sons of Reshef would be the arrows that he shoots that carry the pestilence and the disease. Um, and, of course, I know we've talked about, I th- I'm pretty sure this is one of the places where we talked about Reshef before, um, was in terms of Psalm 91 in the Hebrew, 90 in the Greek. Uh, which is um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that's of the six exorcism psalms that they held or written by David. Uh, psalm 91 slash 90 is the one that's actually con- the canonical psalm. The other five we only know from uh, Qumran. But uh, so that exorcism psalm in verse five talks about the arrows that fly by day. Um, all of those, if you read the original Hebrew, are references, and this is, again, I believe we've gone through this on the show, and that's one of the places we talked about Reshef, the, you know, the demon of noonday, all of those things are references to particular sort of demonic entities and spirits of calamity in the ancient world. Yeah, uh, although, although that one in particular doesn't mention, re- doesn't use the word Reshef, but right. there is this idea of the arrows that fly by day and, you know, you know, it's their their references right. to without actually naming in that particular case. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And since it's in a list of very clear references, sometimes using the names of other <laughs> right uh demonic entities, it's a pretty clear yeah. link. Yep. Um so um some of you may have gone back and looked at that verse and been like in Revelation, (laughs) and said, uh, you know, there's nothing actually in that verse in uh, Revelation 6 about disease at all, 
Right. Even though we we all kind of call this one pestilence. Right. Nonetheless, every, right, everywhere you look, that's what this horseman is is called. And that's because even though um, I imagine most folks, not everybody, but I imagine most folks hadn't really heard of Reshef before this show or some other similar show or they read DDD or something, um, that identification that we just sort of walked through has been held on to in within the Christian tradition, even if it hasn't been made explicit, right? Even if there isn't some place where somebody sat down and said, yes, this is Reshef, da 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 that's why we say that this horseman is pestilence, right? The horseman is just identified as pestilence. That interpretation is continued and contained in the tradition. Hmm. And so this is, I think, illustrative of how we work with our Holy Orthodox tradition on this show a lot of the time. Um, we, will, we will sometimes, uh, I don't know, we will sometimes, sometimes there are folks out there who um, assume that uh, if they listen to this show, for example, and hear something they've never heard before, that either we're making it up or this is some newfangled academic thing uh, or something, and therefore can't be part of Orthodox tradition somehow because they haven't heard it before. Uh, There's a bunch of problems with that. Uh, One being... If you assume that anything you haven't heard before is new, you're assuming you know everything. <laughs> but some people do, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, like that's that's the missing uh, <laughs> plank in your syllogism, yeah. right? I've never heard this before. I know everything. Therefore, this is new, <laughs> right? Like, that's the only way to make that syllogism work. Um, it sounds like a boring life. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. Um, as the person who actually knows everything, actually, it's great. <laughs> no. Um, so, the, the, so the, there's that problem, right? But also the fact that our, our holy tradition has maintained everything you need to understand the holy scriptures, right, and every other part of our tradition, the fact that it's all contained there doesn't mean it has all been made explicit to, for, and in every generation. Yeah, or that there's some kind of manual somewhere where you can look it all up. Right, right. And so just like we as Orthodox Christians don't say, hey, just, you know, read the Bible, no interpretation needed, no teaching needed, no preaching needed, right? I, at least, as a priest, read the gospel on uh, on Sundays at liturgy, and then I preach. And hopefully, if I'm doing a half-decent job, then whatever I'm preaching, I'm saying the same thing that the gospel said. Yeah, which is what the word homily, omelia, right. it means the same. But what I'm trying to do is take what the gospel says and sort of draw it out and explain it and lay it out to people and show how it applies to their life and what's going on in their life and what they need to do based on it, right? And so the fact that maybe no one, maybe no one has, let's just say no one has, let's leave out the you haven't heard, right? Let's say no one has ever laid out the point of a particular parable of Jesus exactly the way I did on a particular Sunday, right, in southern Louisiana in the 21st century, right, to a particular group of people. That doesn't mean I'm actually doing anything different or doing anything wrong. Because I'm talking to a different group of people at a different time, in a different place, in a different setting. Yeah, and then so the way, and, way, saying, and yeah. even though we wouldn't compare ourselves to the holy fathers of the church, 
we're, we're at least trying to adopt their method, which, I mean, this is what they largely are doing, is trying to explain the scriptures and explain the tradition to people. And sometimes they will do it in a, in a way that's new, but saying the same thing as has always been said. Right, right. So, yeah, the, it's not that we and the church fathers are not called to do different things. The church fathers are just really, really good at it, and I'm not. Right? That's the difference. <laughs> right? Like, they're really good at it. But they're doing the same thing. Right? Um, but, yeah, so you could even compare, and this is the problem, this is why people have heard me say, if understood correctly, the fathers never actually disagree. Right? Because the way that a particular passage of Scripture needs to be drawn out and laid out and explained to a congregation in a certain economic and social group in 19th century Russia, and the way it needed to be drawn out and laid out and explained to another congregation in Constantinople near the end of the 4th century is not identical. It's the same scripture, it's the same teaching, but to make it plain, to make it understandable, to apply it to what's going on, is going to look very different in those two different historical and cultural contexts. Yeah, I mean, I can give a really quick example, which is, um, like, if you read St. Theophan the Recluse, who's a 19th century Russian saint, uh, he writes a lot of letters to people. He often talks about feelings, like having certain kinds of spiritual feelings. People in the 5th century <laughs> didn't talk that way at all. They weren't talking about yes. have a feeling, look, go for this feeling, follow this feeling. Now, what St. Theophan means by feeling is not what late 20th, 20, 20th and early 21st century, you know, post-Freudian ideas about feelings mean by feelings. But still, like, it's a very different kind of way of talking than that, that early stuff. Right. Right. Yep. And so here, even though, yes... You're not going to find a lot of church fathers talking about the ancient Canaanite god Reshef directly in terms of, of Revelation 6, right? But as I think we've shown, the fact that they identify this horseman with pestilence means they've maintained that identification. Yeah. Right? Even if they're not making it explicit because making that explicit doesn't serve their purposes, or maybe they didn't even know that. Yeah. They knew that this is pestilence, right? They knew how to interpret and apply revelation, but they didn't know anything about ancient Canaanite gods. Yeah. It may just not be the that's things one of, that they had read about or heard about. Yeah. That's one of the, that's one of the, the beautiful things about our holy tradition is that one can just accept it, <laughs> Right. And know that you are in good stead, right? And then having accepted it, becoming a part of it, living within it, you can then start to explore it and go into the depths of it and the nooks and the crannies, right? But the fact that you haven't explored every depth and nook of cr and cranny, because you never will in this life, right? Uh, the fact that you haven't done all that doesn't mean that you're like an ignorant Christian or something, right? Because if you have accepted it and you're living within it, you have the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I don't need to know how my car works in order to drive it. Well, I know some things. Well, I mean, you know, there's there certain things if you don't know, you could really mess up your car. Yeah, of course. But like, I don't know how you it just talks to my phone run out of gas on the side of the road. <laughs> I've heard that that could be an issue. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, we've done we've done death. We've done pestilence. Two more horsemen to go, and we've got some other bad guys. Rick Flair about. and Arn Anderson. Oh, That's wait, right. no. <laughs> all right, we'll be right back after this. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Hi, do you know me? I'm Father Stephen DeYoung. My new book, Apocrypha, An Introduction to Extra-Biblical Literature, is now available. A lot of Christians today divide ancient Jewish and Christian literature into two categories. What's in the Bible, what's not in the Bible. 
Christian East, however, has traditionally had a third category, a middle category, books that are read privately in the home. The Greek word for that is apocrypha. These texts from the centuries before and the centuries after the incarnation of Christ that go beyond even the larger canons of Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches reveal to us the religious world and theological framework of the apostles and early church fathers. In this book, Apocrypha, I survey these works which connect elements of liturgy, scripture, iconography, patristic writings. Familiarity with these works will enhance readers' understanding of the breadth and depth of the Orthodox Christian faith. Buy your copy of Apocrypha, an introduction to extra-biblical literature at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Welcome to the second half of this episode of our series of eschatology here on the Lord of Spirits podcast. We're talking in this case about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Gog and Magog, and of course, about locusts. Um, So we've talked about two of the horsemen so far. We talked about death and pestilence. So uh, who's up next for our next boom slash behold slash what slash low Idu, etc. Or boom shakalaka. No, that's a good one too far. That's we're in NBA Jam territory. I remember that game. I loved that game. That was a great game, actually. So, <laughs> um, you heard it here first. Father Andrew used to love a sports ball game. That's true. Uh, we actually have not too far from where I live. <sighs> There is an arcade called Back to the Arcade with the requisite Back to the Future looking logo. And uh, they have they have NBA Jam there. and Or is it Jams? See, I can't remember now. And uh, I showed it to one of my sons when I was there. <laughs> and he didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> but I was having all kinds of nostalgia. And I was indeed right. saying, boom, shakalaka. Which you get so, when you uh, do like a big, high, jumping yeah. dunk, you know? Yes. Yeah. Full rotation, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. I may or may not have all the arcade games in my living room. <laughs> can neither confirm nor deny. Though there are people out there who can confirm. Amen and shit. Um, so, yeah. So, the third uh, horseman who we're going to talk about, the second one to uh, ride out. And... Uh, no, they are not pawing at the streets of gold <laughs> and sending gold chips down into the checkbooks of uh, TBN donors. Sorry, late Paul Crouch. I've heard um, that's a thing, though. <laughs> he claims so. So, I know. you know. That's so good. Um, I mean, that is creativity right there. Yeah, and maybe his wife's hair was to protect her from the flying gold shards. Who knows? Um, so, uh, TBN shade on this episode yeah. of the Lord of Spirits. <sighs> so uh, they don't mind. Um, you know, I okay now. Now you did it. Um, <clears throat> I know someone who owns a copy of the Heidelberg Catechism. Okay. One of the Dutch Reformed Three Forms of Unity. Right. Okay, Dutch Reformed Catechism. Uh, with a sticker in the front saying it's a free gift from uh, Paul Crouch. Nice. <laughs> nice. Actual artifact. <laughs> That's beautiful. That should be in a museum. <laughs> yeah, don't know how it happened, for sure. But there it is. So, War. What is what it is good, it good for? for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, Original title for War and Peace, by the way. Just War? War, what is it good for? Oh, oh okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if if uh, 
the Horseman of War is a uh, low rider, but um, the uh, we hear about him in verses uh, three and four of uh, chapter six. As we mentioned, he's the third one we're going to talk about. He's the second one who uh, appears. All right. Yes. So, pale horse for death, white horse for pestilence, and now starting with verse three. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. So the red horse of war. Yeah. And that's a great sword as in big. Hmm. It's not like that sword's really great. (laughs) That sword's awesome. Um, Yeah, it's huge. Huge sword. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, you know, I mean, I know what everyone's thinking, right? They're thinking Dark Riders. They're thinking this must be one of those completely disproportionate anime swords that's so giant, the person wielding it could not possibly lift it. Um, you're probably going too far with it. <laughs> um, so this rider, identifying this rider as war is not much of a stretch, right? So he takes peace from the earth. And if you take peace away, what do you have? You have war. Yeah. Uh, so that people should slay one another. That's war. Right. Um, but the important element here in terms of identifying this rider with a kind of demonic entity or entity in general from the Old Testament is this sword. Um, and... Specifically, the way in which the sword is referred to in the Hebrew Bible. Um, There are a lot of places where the sword is used, where it's clearly not referring to a sword, (laughs) right? Just a sword as an as an object, Um, and where uh, the sword is talked about as being an entity, as being something with agency that does things, uh, something that is sent, uh, something which uh, remains in a place or in a family or among a people. Um, and so it's, it, it takes a certain kind of special pleading that modern people are very capable of, but it takes a kind of special pleading to read it as just being a metaphor, right? Right. Oh, there's there's just going to be like strife and violence, right? Um, and the problem with I mean, let's get right down to it. The problem with taking it as a metaphor is that uh, strife or violence has to have an agent. Yeah, it doesn't just happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like. Someone's just standing there minding their own business, and all of a sudden, you know, they be, are physically injured by nothing in particular. Right? Like, violence has to have an agent. Right? And so, if violence or strife or conflict is going to come into a family, a tribe, a nation, right, between one of those and another of those, Right, it has to have an agent. There has to be someone who's actually doing it, right? And so there are places in Scripture, very clearly, where God sends an agent to do something, sometimes something violent, right? Like sending in the descendants of Abraham to root out the giant clans, (coughs) right? There's the agent, right? Uh, or uh, when God sends Nebuchadnezzar to take Judah into exile for their sinfulness, right? Or he sends the Assyrians to wipe out the northern kingdom of Israel. There you've got your agent, right? But there are other places where God just says he's going to send the sword. Yeah. Where the sword is the agent. (laughs) So that's not speaking as an analogy for violence in general or bloodshed in general, that's speaking of a kind of entity, a spiritual entity, meaning 
It's a spirit because it has agency, an entity with agency that's going to inspire and cause this violence and bloodshed and strife to happen. Um, Relatedly, another term that's used beside the sword uh, in a similar kind of way is uh, the way the Hebrew word for blood is used when it's used in the plural. Bloods. So not dom, but damim, which literally means bloods, <laughs> right? But which, when used in the plural, represents not just, again, metaphorically, well, bloods, plural, lots of blood, bloodshed, right? But referring to a kind of agent connected to to bloodshed. Um, so to give you an idea, we're not going to read all these. We're not going to go through all these. But to give you an idea of how common these references to the sword as an agent are in the Hebrew Bible, here is a partial list. This is a partial list. Okay? And I'm just going to jack that impy it. I'm going to go through it full speed. <laughs> you can look it up later. You can pause this if you really want to look every single one up. Uh, Exodus 5, verse 8, 22, verse 24, Leviticus 26, verses 7 and 8 and 25, Numbers 14, verse 43, Numbers 20, verse 18, Deuteronomy 28, verse 22, and 32, verse 25, 2 Samuel 2, verse 26, 11, verse 25, 12, verse 10, 18, verse 8, Ezra 9, verse 7, Job 5, verse 15, 20, 22, 29, 27, verse 14, 39, verse 22, Psalm 22, verse 20, Psalm 37, verse 15, Psalm 63, verse 10, Psalm 76, verse 3, Psalm 78, verse 62 and 64, Psalm 144, verse 10, Isaiah 1, verse 20, 31, verse 8, and 37, verse 7. Bingo! Yeah. (laughs) And there are others, right? But that should give you an idea of how common this is to say, talk about the sword as this agent, this spiritual agent, right? And often... It is um, the the sword is associated with verbs like devour, consume, right? This idea of devouring, consuming lives, right? A la moat, the hellmouth, right? Um, And so here we can kind of see the pattern emerging, right? This is going to hold true when we get to famine also that these other three, these are sort of the three ways you don't want to die. Right. So the the blessed way to die in the Hebrew Bible is old, full of years, surrounded by your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, right, around your table. That's the blessed way to die, right? That's the way the patriarchs die in Genesis. Gathered unto his fathers. Right. That's that's how you want to die. Well, the ways you die other than that, the ways you die short of that, the way you miss that blessing are what? Violence, disease, starvation. Right, in, in the ancient world. And in an agrarian context. We may not think about it starvation as much as we used to. We're also not living in an agrarian context. Right? There are parts of the world that still famine and starvation are very real concerns. Um, Even if they aren't for us in a lot of the countries that will be listening to this in English. Um, But in the ancient world, they were for everybody. Right? So these three kinds of death in particular, these are like the bad deaths. These are the deaths you don't want. Violence certainly being... uh, one of the chief among them. Um, now, bloods, when bloods is used in the plural, it's a little more nuanced because the bloodshed here isn't just violence, but it's a kind, uh, it refers to a kind of debt related to vengeance for spilled blood. Hmm. Right? The idea being if a person has spilled innocent blood, right, they've committed a kind of a a paradigmatic injustice, right? There's a person who should be alive, right, who should be part of the world and the social order, but because of you is dead, 
right? And so this is a paradigmatic injustice. And one of the problems with it as a paradigmatic injustice is, right, if I steal money from you, there's a relatively easy way to put that back to justice, yeah, right? give the money That's, back. I give the money back, right? I can't give life back to someone if I've murdered them. Yeah. So what's the only way to kind of rectify that? Blood for blood. Right, for me to die too, right? Um, and so uh, this isn't just a concept in the Hebrew Bible. This is a concept everywhere in the ancient world. Yeah, and even, uh, I mean, everywhere in the world, right? Even as you go yeah. on and on and on. Like like even the ancient uh, Germanic peoples had the idea of the Wehrgeld, which means the human price, you kill somebody, you, you can you can pay their family, basically is what it comes down to. Uh, and the idea of it was to try to prevent feuds, you know, like, well, right. look, yeah, pay, blood feud. pay us off and the, we don't have to have a blood feud. Yeah. So, but this was in the ancient Near East, this in particular had this uh, care that there were seen to be sort of demonic spiritual beings who were going to enforce this kind of justice. Yeah. So it wasn't just a question of law. Right. Uh, and being caught by some kind of authority and being executed or being murdered by a family member of the victim even. Um, but some of these uh, killings were seen as so heinous that you get, so what probably the most example of which people would be most aware, most of our listeners would be in the context of Greek tragedy, the way the Furies function. Right, someone commits patricide or matricide or right uh, fratricide, and this is seen as sort of a, a, a not just because it's related to the family. It's not only murder; it's murder that's a form of high sacrilege, right? Um, and so, even if you don't get caught, right, these you know the Arrhenius will sort of come up out of Hades and drag you down with them right um and tear you apart um there is this kind of vengeance right that's it's like cosmic these demonic entities of cosmic vengeance um which is not unrelated to how for example most 1980s horror movies function uh right they're very similar to greek tragedy <laughs> in that respect um all the all the non-virtuous kids are the ones who end up dead, right? right? All the ones who who sleep around and use drugs and that kind of thing, uh, they all end up getting torn to pieces by the 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 uh, sort of cosmic entities, right? Whereas the the ones who are virtuous are are end up safe. Um. But there's even a reference uh, in the Greek of Psalm 87 to the Furies. Yeah, which, I mean, this is one of the six psalms that is read at Matins. And in the translation used in, at least in the Antiochian Archdiocese of North America, there's the line, Thy Furies have passed upon me, and thy terrors have sorely troubled me. So the idea that the Furies belong to God and are connected to him you know yeah and and that the psalmist is facing this torment right <laughs> sort of because of what he's done um this is also what uh, david is referring to in psalm 51 in the hebrew 50 in the greek verse 14 it's usually translated as something like deliver me from blood guiltiness yeah in the english um but literally in the hebrew it's deliver me from bloods Hmm. And this is that Hebrew idiom. The idea is that da it's not just that David feels guilty, right? It's that having killed Uriah and taken Bathsheba as his wife, he is liable, right, that bl to that blood, right? There is this sort of metaphysical debt. Right, that that he has uh, he has on his soul. 
right? That he needs to be, he needs to be delivered from the consequence of that by God. Um, and of course, it goes the f- the first example to it. The Bible goes all the way back to Genesis four and Abel's blood crying up out of the ground. Yeah, against his brother Cain for justice. Yeah, um, and this kind of factors in in Genesis thirty seven, verses twenty two through twenty six. Uh, Joseph's brothers are kind of trying to decide what to do with him. Remember, some of them want to just kill him, right? Right, and go dump him in the desert somewhere. But uh, a couple of his older brothers have some concerns about that. Yes. Okay. So this is starting with verse 22. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? So yeah, it's this idea that, like, look, we, we can't kill him. Because yeah. bad things will happen to us if that, you know. Because of the blood. We do, yeah. because of the blood. Yeah. Yeah. And so we can't do this. They know what will happen, like with Abel. And so, you know, they're willing to go sell him into slavery in Egypt, but they won't. Okay. They don't want to spill any blood. Yeah. Um, and, of course, um, in the context of Revelation 6 itself, the fifth seal, the seal after the four horsemen is uh, when that is open, the martyr, the souls of the martyrs cry out from beneath the altar in heaven, asking how long, O Lord, right? They cry out for justice, um, specifically over their shed blood. And Revelation 6 uses the same verb for slay, but it talks about war, the horsemen, slaying, right, people on the earth. And the martyrs having been slain. Hmm. So war and the other horsemen are part of the balancing of the scales of justice there for those who have been slain unjustly. Now there's going to be this slayer who is sort of unleashed on the earth. To avenge those who have been slain. I was trying to come up with a, uh, a metal band joke for that, but it just wasn't wasn't coming to me. But what well, I mean, I mean, the Slayer, come on! I know I'm not a Alpha I'm not Heaven, a, actually a big Slayer blood fan. So <laughs> I know I'm so disappointing. It's okay. Oh, you should at least go listen to Tori Amos's cover of Raining Blood. Wow, which is a thing, which is real. Huh. Um, so uh, this is also this idea of of sh- having shed blood that that blood um, contracting this kind of debt, right? Of of violence. The person who lives by the sword dies by the sword, right? The sword. Um, the uh, is is also where we get some of the language, for example, in Matthew twenty verse twenty eight or in First Timothy two verse six, of the blood of a sacrifice as a kind of ransom. Hmm. Right, the idea of it cleansing or purifying from that sort of debt incurred by having shed blood. Um. So then. The, the fourth horseman we're going to talk about, the third one who comes riding out, uh, is famine. Famine. All right. Again, Revelation 6, verses 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. 
I mean, this is another one, the, another one of those where, like, we identify this as famine, but it's not super obvious just from this text. This is about <laughs> famine. Like, okay, he's got a, he's got a scales in his hands, and he's talking about buying food, but you know, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> right. So, um, this is the the Hebrew word for famine is raav. Um, and uh, Rav was not coincidentally the third figure in Mote's retinue hmm. in the ancient Phoenician and, and uh, Canaanite stories um, and named literally Famine. The idea here going on with the scales, uh, these are marketplace scales. right? So scales come up a lot when you read uh, the prophets yeah. uh, in this context scales in the marketplace using just balances, just scales, just weights, right um, because it's not like you walk into a village, there's not some massive authority who can come and say okay, this is how much exactly how much a shekel weighs and this guy's shekel in his balance scale is heavier than it should be, or this one's is lighter than it should be. Right? Like, there's no way to go around enforcing that. Right. Right. Um, hypothetically, we have that now. I'm somewhat suspicious that at no time recently has anyone been to any of our local gas stations and actually measured a gallon of gas to make sure it's really a gallon. <laughs> Hypothetically, they do that, but uh, they definitely did not do anything like that in the ancient world, right? No, and right. so, the the way someone, the primary way someone was dishonest in business when you're trading, because you're primarily trading in the ancient world by close to pure bartering, <laughs> right, is by fudging weights, yeah, right, by you know, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm giving you this much of that, and you're actually giving them less, right? Right. Um, so there's this notion of cheating Yeah. going along with it. Right. Um, and so, um, and of course, for obvious reasons, right, the people who most got taken advantage of in the ancient world were the poor and the powerless, right? So... People who were in poverty in general, especially orphans and widows, because orphans and widows couldn't even take you to court over it, right? Um, there were people who could be exploited. And so again and again, you see these things about people, people being exploited. The particular examples we get here are meant to give us the idea that, that food is so expensive that people can't afford it, right? So a denarius is was uh, one day's wages, right? For workers who worked for something like a wage, right? Uh, a lot of people didn't work for a wage. There were a huge swath of people subsistence farming, but for people who work for a wage and who then use that wage to go and get food and the other things they needed in the marketplace, a denarius was one day's wage. So if you think about you could get a quart of wheat for one day's wage. You have to work all day just to get a quart of wheat. You have no money for anything else now. Right. Um, so this is the idea behind the scales and this being shouted vis-a-vis -vis the marketplace is that this isn't just to represent like, oh, yeah, you're going to have bad crops for a couple years, but that that's going to produce a chain reaction that's going to destroy the markets, the economy, yeah. right, that existed at the time. And everyone suffers then. Yeah, so this is describing, like, the Great Depression. It's ancient equivalent, right, um, where it's going to reach and touch everybody, right? And famine could be a force for a kind of justice in the same way that we were just talking about violence being, right, in the sense that, well, this innocent person was murdered, and so now the murderer's dead too. 
um, which is a kind of justice, not the ideal form, but a kind of it. Um, in the same way, the people who have oppressed the poor deprive them of their wages, uh, uh, profited off of their hunger, oppress the orphan and the widow. When this happens, right, everyone is affected. They don't have any food either. Right, those who had become rich and, and wealthy. And so there's sort of an equalizer of outright famine like this describes that hits everyone. Right. And so there's a sort of justice to those who have oppressed and starved the poor now starving themselves. Not the ideal kind of justice, but a kind mm. uh, nonetheless. Um and not only is Ra'av or famine seen as being part of Mote's retinue, uh, but especially in the prophet Jeremiah, uh, you see him pair together famine and the sword, sometimes famine and the sword and plague, right? All three together, often just famine and the sword. Um, some examples I will Van Impey them again. Uh, and these are all Hebrew references. I, I'm not going to list both references. I love that Van Impey is now a verb. Yes. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 2, verse 30, 4, verse 10, 5, verse 12, 9, verse 16, 14, verses 12 through 16, 15, verses 2 and 3, 16, verse 4, 21, verses 7 through 9, 24, verse 10, 25, verse 16, and 27 through 29, 32, verses 24 through 26, 42, verses 16 through 22, and 44, verses 12 through 18 are some examples, <laughs> right? Um, and what these examples have in common is that they present famine in the sword and where it's also added pestilence or disease or plague as being these kind of spiritual forces that are unleashed by Yahweh, the God of Israel, as a form of judgment. And that's unleashed in a very literal sense. They're often portrayed as sort of these beasts that accompany him who he has on a leash, right? Think of, think of the Satan in Job, yeah. right? He wants to do stuff to Job. He has to kind of get permission, and then he's given limits, right? Yeah. Um, and the idea is that God is sort of restraining uh, these things from us and protecting us from these things, but that eventually there comes a time where without repentance, where he will stop restraining them. At least he'll restrain them less. He'll let them come into our lives, our families, our tribe, nation, whatever, in order to bring about that repentance that so far we have not, we have not shown. Um, and a good example of that dynamic of God sort of unleashing these forces out of the world to go bring about justice, and one that sort of clearly prefigures what St. John is doing with the four horsemen is actually in Zechariah 6, verses 1 through 8. Yeah, so this is kind of the first appearance of the four, four horsemen, uh, although a, a little different, a little different. So starting with verse 1, again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, these are going out to the four winds of heaven, after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes toward the north country, the white ones go after them, and the dappled ones go toward the south country. When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and patrol the earth. And he said, Go, patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried to me, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. So it's chariots in this case that seem to have multiple horses each, but the the colors are there again. Um, yeah, dappled yeah. instead of pale. You know, colors are always kind of a <laughs> an iffy question in the ancient world, but in the <coughs> text, right. you know. But but um, yeah. So, 
Um, but you see the issue here, right, is that there's something going on in the north. Go figure, the north. Um, <laughs> it's always those guys. Right, that has disrupted justice, right? And so these horsemen are let loose. They're sent into the north, and then once they're done, God's spirit is at rest in the north. They've taken care of the issue, right? The judgment has taken place. Um, so these powers, right, Moat and his, and his pals, right, uh, Moat himself was not sort of worshipped or invoked uh, yeah. in the ancient world because you just wanted to keep death away from you mostly. Right, and this is nasty, violent, untimely death. Yes, this is not like Thanatos with the Greeks. Right. right. Um, the other, like Reshef, Ra'av, right, uh, the sword, this kind of thing, these were the subject of worship and invocation, um, and that in sort of two ways, right? So you get um, sacrificial worship with these gods, either sort of defenses, defensive, like, hey, be happy with us, leave, kind of leave us alone, yeah. right? Yeah, here, have some meat <laughs> yeah. instead of us. Yeah. And, and or, hey, you know, our enemies over there, why don't you go after them? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. right. Um, that, so, you know, that element. And then, of course, we're using more, what we would call magic, right? So amulets, bowl incantations, curses, and that kind of thing. The same thing, right? Yeah. Ward them off from you, send them after the guy you don't like, yeah. right? Yep. Um, that kind of thing. So... The way they're discussed in the Hebrew Bible, though, of course, as we've seen now, is different, right? All of these forces are controlled by Yahweh, the God of Israel, right, in the Old Testament. It's not that they're not forces. It's not that they're not demonic. It's not that they're some kind of materialist function of something or other, right? But they're they're controlled by Yahweh, the God of Israel. And when they're released into the world, they're released at his timing for his purposes, Right, and there are always limits put on it. Yeah, look at Job again. Yeah. Right, um, and so regardless of what may be happening to you, to your nation, to your tribe, to your clan, to your people, right? Um, the only thing you need to do, from the perspective of the Hebrew Bible, is repent and worship. Yahweh, the God of Israel. Yeah. Who you is don't, of all these things. don't offer worship to those other gods to placate them. Don't use magical incantations and stuff to control them or, you know, yeah, be faithful yeah. to, to God. And so um, this is really um, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible version of theodicy. Yeah, theodicy being the explanation for why bad stuff happens. Yeah, God is good, God is all-powerful, bad stuff happens, right? Right. Um, and so the understanding is that God is not the direct agent of any of these evils, right? But that these demonic powers who have power in the world because of human wickedness and evil, God unleashes at times into varying degrees to bring about repentance, right? To bring about transformation, to bring good, to use them sort of against their will to bring good out of human evil. Right. So the ultimate agent of all wickedness in the world in the Hebrew Bible is humans. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and even the demons who are in this middle space are being used by God for our good if we allow it to bring us to, to repentance. Um, and so what St. John is doing here with the four horsemen, and which he does again and again in the book of Revelation, he's doing, he has the same kind of idea when they open the 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 abyss they're all there's lots and lots of imagery over and over again in the different cycles of the book of revelation of this but that at the end as we're approaching the final judgment right when things will finally all be set right 
when when justice will finally prevail, that as the time of God's patience comes to an end in favor of justice, that there will be this kind of final unleashing of these powers, right? Where God will remove the restraints, remove sort of the protection that we've had from the consequences of our own actions up till that point. There's this final unleashing and that's to bring about a great final repentance before the end, right? This is sort of the last shot, right? So the reason why the scriptures are getting again, that portray things as getting really, really bad right before the end is that God intends things getting really, really bad to be this last final call to repentance. Hmm before it's too late because it's the repentance that he wants to see. And it's because it's the repentance that he wants to see that we see with the four horsemen, even with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, there are still limits. Yeah. It's still only a portion of the earth that's subjected to them more than ever before, but still within limits because the goal is still to bring the wicked to repentance, not to destroy them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, that wraps up the second half of this episode of The Lord of Spirits. But we've got a third half because, as we like to say, or as I like to say anyway, it's a show and a half. So we'll be right back after this. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of The Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO from Ancient Faith Publishing. Arise, O God, the Gospel of Christ's Defeat of Demons, Sin, and Death, written by Andrew Stephen Damick. This book is not a sales pitch. I hope that instead it will be an authentic, true proclamation of the Gospel. How or whether you respond to it is important, but I'm not going to make a marketing appeal to you at the end. Knowing what the Gospel is, and being able to teach it to someone else does not require that you know everything in this book. But by the end of it, you should know what a gospel is, why there is a gospel at all, what the gospel is, and what the response to it requires. Arise, O God, the gospel of Christ's defeat of demons, sin, and death. Now available as an audiobook at audible.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Welcome back. It's the third half of the Lord of Spirits podcast, and uh, or say of this episode of the podcast. I don't want to make people think that uh, the podcast is getting close to ending. I don't know. How long do you think we should make this podcast go, Father? Hmm. <coughs> I don't know. I haven't thought too much about it. I don't it. know. I've been, I've been, I've been thinking, uh, I've been thinking uh, five years total. Five years total? Yeah. I mean, whole counsel of God took you 12 and a half years to go all the way through the Bible. Although, who knows how long it's yeah. going to take this second time around. How old will you yeah. be? I mean, you should be like 60, right? By the time you finish it the next time, at least. Hypothetically, <laughs> I mean, now technically, technically, I don't have to go all the way through this time. That's true, because ancient faith has from Luke on. I mean, technically, I could stop at Deuteronomy chapter five <laughs> <laughs> and have a real quick second go around. That's but true. I feel like I need to at least go through the end of the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. Just yeah. to use up as much of ancient faith's hard drive space and bandwidth as I possibly You know, the thing is, is a hard drive space is really a dime a dozen these days. <laughs> you know, A dime for a dozen what? I don't know, but you don't need those scales from famine, you know, to make this work out. Okay. Uh, well, it cost me a whole day's wage for one episode of Whole Council. Of and now that you said what you said, all these people are like, oh, there's only two years left. There's only <laughs> two years left to the podcast. Who knows? We'll see. There could be. It could be. There could be. If you run out of stuff to say, you can just you retire. Don't know what you got till it's gone. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Pave paradise, put it in a parking lot. 
we could do like you know we could also loop around and you know do you know angels and demons redux and and you know yeah. even bigger and better we record the old episodes yeah where with, people could actually hear everything <laughs> with less less mexican radio and and such i don't feel like that would be an improvement though no i mean i feel like people need to have a warm fuzzy feeling about the mexican radio by this point yes yeah i miss it frankly yeah Alas. I grew up in Southern California. I always felt at home. Mm. Dulcet tones. Yeah. Lilting through my ungrounded <laughs> electronics. <laughs> well, um, we are talking about uh, the bad boys, the apocalypse. This time around, we've gone through the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But wait, there's more. Uh, they're not the only baddies in uh, at the end. Um, and as we've seen at various other points in the scripture too, like it's not like the four horsemen show up for the first time, even with all that, you know, bam, going on uh, there in Revelation six, um, they do show up at other points. But there's other other figures that we want to discuss too. And and uh, for those of you who are fans of the late great planet Earth, by Mr. Hal Lindsey, um, you might be familiar with Gog and Magog, and that's what we're going to talk about yeah. now. Um, with some other stuff. Mostly Gog. Mostly Gog. Magog. And also a little bit of Magog. <laughs> yes. Not yeah. just Gog. And how they, how they also... relate to Kingdom Come. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The Kingdom Come. So, all right. Where should we start? Well, we should, I, I was about to say we should begin at the beginning, but... <laughs> it's a very uh, good place to actually start. Actually, we're not. No. <laughs> yes. Uh, as much as I like making that joke... Uh, both Rogersing and Hammersteining. Wow. Um, and uh, I'm just going to make everyone's name into a verb now. There we go. Um, but we're actually going to start with the main biblical passage that talks about Gog, Magog, at all. Okay. Not the world of Gog yeah. or Mystagogs, but... <laughs> Gog and Magog, at least. That's uh, Ezekiel chapter 38. Okay, so I'm going to read a bunch to you all to just listen, and we're going to talk about bits of it. Story time with Father Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Starting with verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Togarma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil scheme and say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates, to seize, spoil, and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, and the people who are gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell at the center of the earth." Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all its leaders will say to you, Have you come to seize spoil? Have you assembled your hosts to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to seize great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know it? You will come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north. You and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great host, a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. In the latter day I will bring you against my land, that the nations may know me. When through you, O Gog, 
I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who in those days prophesied for years that I would bring you against them? But on that day, the day that Gog shall come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, my wrath will be roused in my anger. For in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath, I declare, on that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep on the ground and all the people who are on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the cliffs shall fall and every wall shall tumble to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence and bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain upon him and his hordes and the many peoples who are with him, torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Like a Pulp Fiction ending there. Well, remember, this is one of the places where we would be helped by translating it as, then they will know that I am Yahweh. Yeah, right. 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 Um, so uh, one of the first things people might have noticed right off the jump is that in Ezekiel, Gog and Magog aren't like two dudes. Like Gog is from Magog. Yeah, it's a person from a place. Yeah, Gog is a person and Magog is a place. Um, So it's not clear exactly when people started saying Gog and Magog. Mm. But we find it in in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We find it in some other Second Temple literature. And so that was already an established usage by the time, and we're going to get to it in the book of Revelation, when St. John refers to Gog and Magog. That and had already been around for a couple of centuries, Hmm. right? Although it's unclear exactly how that, right? Um, So, uh, and even though Magog is the place where he's from, um, Gog is the leader of this whole sort of coalition of nations, right? Uh, And that coalition of nations, it's not like a group of nations that are next to each other. Um, because it's, uh, it includes Kush and Put, which are African nations. It includes Persia, right? It includes, uh, Gomer, right? And these are all different directions from Israel. And the conquest that's talked about goes as far as like Tarshish, which is in what's now Spain, Hmm. Uh, and, and Sheba and Dedan, which is down at the end of the Arabian Peninsula, right? So we're covering all the compass directions, right? Like sort of the whole known world is involved with this, uh, even though Gog and his armies are said to come from the north, which is one of the things that indicates to us that this is the sacred geography direction north, yeah, right? that's place wh- of evil. Where the bad guys are. Yeah, rather than being literal from the literal north, because of course Persia is not north of Israel. Yeah, and those African nations are kind and, of west. yeah. Libya is not north of Israel. Yeah, west and southish. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, there is even within this right clues that people should take, even though a lot of modern people haven't taken them, <laughs> that this is not just talking, not not intended to be literally referring to a particular king at the time of Ezekiel who had actually put together this precise coalition, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and in the response, in God's response in his judgment, you see that God responds by sort of unleashing demonic powers like the ones we were just talking about. Like in verse 21, when God says, I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, right? Then he's sort of unleashing these demonic powers on Gog himself, right? 
um, as a response to justice against Gog's injustice. So in trying to work out who exactly Gog is and where exactly Magog is, right, from people who are taking the approach of we need to match this up to a place or just, hey, let's look at the other places where these terms are used in Scripture, right, and try to understand how these things connect. The main place where Magog is re referenced in Scripture other than this is in Genesis chapter 10 in the Table of Nations. Yeah, when you got all those big lists of all the descendants of Noah, the, the descendants of his three sons. Right, and Gog is, or sorry, not Gog, Magog is one of the um, sons of Japheth. So this would right. be a, a grandson of Noah. Right, and Japheth, we talked about before, is sort of the father of the Indo-Europeans, Um and so those nations get grouped under there. That doesn't boil it down a ton. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I mean, um, and, and some of these other sons of Japheth, like in Genesis 10 too, you've got Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Meshach, Tiras. So right. these are some of these other, other sons of Japheth that are, that are mentioned in that list of those that Gog has come in with him from Ezekiel. Right. Right. So, it's sort of a sampler platter of grandsons of Noah, right? That's yeah. obviously going back a long way, right? Um, the uh, and you know, um, I th I think I'll go ahead and say I think that. Uh, it would even be taking it too literally to just say, oh, it's just referencing like the Indo-Europeans. Um, because you also have Kush yeah. and put a list who are not Indo-Europeans. Right. Um, so you can't even boil it down to that if you're trying to be literal. So Magog, if you try and attack it etymologically, <laughs> right, uh, the the best folks have come up with so far, shall we say, is that this is from the Assyrian Matgugu. Okay. Which means the land of Gugu. Or Ma that would mean Magog means the land of Gog. Right. Gog from the land of Gog. <laughs> I I'm almost so that's not like super helpful. Yeah, like... <laughs> From the land of, like, I'm always hearing, like, the land of Oz from the land of, anyway. Yes. I am Father Stephen from the house of Father Stephen. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> that's, um, so, yeah, that didn't help so much. Um, and so, in trying to figure out what the Gog in Magog and Gog would be referring to, uh, the best, and I think, still pretty unconvincing argument uh, that people have come up with is that it might be referring to Gyges, who was uh, the first sort of imperial king of Lydia. There were kings of Lydia before him in Asia Minor, but he was the first one to really sort of become a world stage player um, and start to expand his territory. That was in the 7th century BC, so we're about a century before Ezekiel. Okay. Um, so it's not impossible, but obviously he can't be referring to that person as historical person because he's dead. Right. Uh, so even in that kind of context, even if the name is coming from, from Gyges, um, then you have to say, well, Gyges is being used as sort of a type. Right, as sort of a an image of something else, right? Mm. Since obviously Ezekiel wouldn't have to pronounce the doom of somebody already dead. Um, so Lydia, probably the thing Lydia is the most famous for is uh, they invented money. They invented like coins as a means of exchange. There's also some um, some musical modes. There's the Lydian mode. 
and um, hypolydian mode, I think. Hypomixolydian. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Byzantine chant. Yeah. People call in. Correct me. <laughs> and they had they had their own language. Yes. Uh, this obs- which was distinct from <laughs> Luvian and Hittite. Yeah, an, an ancient, now completely lost Indo-European language that was mostly dead by first century BC, even. Yeah. Um, but uh, Gaiji's name was actually uh, Kukos. In Lydian. In Lydian. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing, I, I and, and I haven't told Father Andrew this yet. Uh-oh. Because I was saving this for him. This Gyges, the king of Lydia, okay, is the Gyges of the Ring of Gyges. Okay. The Ring in Plato's Republic that makes people invisible. Oh, that's right. <gasps> Which means <laughs> Gyges, if he is Gog from Magog, is the historical Sauron. Oh, I was going to say he was the historical Gollum, but okay. No. <laughs> Because, you know, there's a G at the beginning, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, at, 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 in The Hobbit, all that we know about that ring is that makes people invisible. Yeah. So. That's true. I'm just saying. That's true. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, no, I am just saying. <laughs> is all. Uh, is, there we go. Well, all right. Yes. So throwing a bone uh, to Eugene up there in Minnesota. Yes, exactly. He is freaking out right now. I do it. <laughs> I told you guys. Yes. He also won a great victory against the Sumerians. C I M M E R I A N. So we've got Conan. We've got <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Nice. All centered around Gog. Anyway. Um, all Gog. All the time. <laughs> Uh, the other place where either of those words occurs in Scripture is in First Chronicles 5, verse 4. There's a gog or a gug, gug. depending on how you read the Hebrew, um, who's a uh, descendant of um, Reuben, uh, and therefore not the guy we're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Because he was an Israelite. Um, also not related is Mangog, by the way. Oh. I, I don't Which know. may have been Stan Lee misspelling some, Magog. Nice. Uh, Mangog is uh, the souls of a billion people killed by Odin, given monstrous form, <laughs> come to <laughs> kill the Norse gods. Oh, but wow. uh, Not unrelated to the bloods we talked about in Half 2, however. Yeah. Um, so the best we could do to boil that down, the best we could do in terms of trying to assign this to a historical personage who Ezekiel might have been addressing is to say, well, he might have been using Gyges, this King Gyges, as, as a type, right? As a representative of this Gog person, sort of the way when we talked about in the Antichrist episode, um, when we talked about how you have antichrist, right? You have individual people like Nero who are sort of an image of, right, this, a representative of this. But you can't get Ezekiel's prophecy to be addressing the historical Gyges because it doesn't work out, chronology, right? Um, now, when you get into... Early, our earliest known interpretation of this, right, of who who this Gog is, right? So now we talked about other places where these words show up in the scriptures, outside the Hebrew scriptures. The earliest interpretation we get is actually, since we're talking about a prophecy of Ezekiel, Ezekiel's living during the exile, so in the middle of the... 6th century B.C. Uh, the earliest interpretation of this that we get isn't in Second Temple Jewish literature. It's in the Greek translations of the Hebrew Scriptures. Yeah, there's some interesting variations. <laughs> so 
This is, and this is critically important. The Greek Old Testament tradition is Second Temple Jewish literature. Yeah, yeah. Because every translation is an interpretation. Right. So effectively, a translation is a commentary. It's Automatically. True. It's true. Right? There's no way around you it. You have to make choices, right? And so our earliest commentary are various Greek passages, some of which refer to Gog in the Greek tradition that don't, at least obviously, in the Hebrew, yeah. in, the, in the original Hebrew. And what that shows us is that the person translating them into Greek was aware of traditions concerning Gog, who Gog was, that existed at the time that the Greek was being translated, uh, and considered those to be the correct way of reading and interpreting the text. Right? These translators didn't sit down and decide, I'm going to change this text. Right. They were reading it and translating it, but in between reading it and translating it are is the, the culture they grew up in, the cultural understandings they had, what they were taught religiously, what they believed religiously, that all form a filter through which the text was passing, right, on the way from their eyes to their pen, right? And so we see Gog stuff existed between those two places and then end up on the page at the other end of the, the pen, pardon the analogy, yeah. uh, in, the, in the Greek translation. And, and the it, biggest one of those is in Amos chapter seven, verse one. Yeah, and and this is the only this is the kind of thing that y'all you only notice it if you actually sit down and and compare these things. You know, you look at what it says in the in even in translations. You know, a translation of the Hebrew and a translation of the Greek, and you start to notice like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is not just like synonyms or whatever but there are other words here that are not in the other one or there's you know some words that are not in the later version that are in the earlier one uh, and that's what this case like so if you look at a, a translation of the hebrew of amos 7 1 it's a longer verse than the than the greek translation from you know from from the the bc period so yeah amos 7 1 so first i'm going to read the esv so this is looking at hebrew texts and translating them this is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. King's mowings. I mean, it feels like that should be the name of some sort of British neighborhood. Oh, I live at King's Mowings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or the name of a landscaping business. Hey, that's right. Um, yeah, so the Greek uh, ends... This way, a swarm of locusts coming early, and behold, one locust, Gog, the king. And in, in Greek, it's idu vrukos isgog o vasilevs. So pretty straightforward. Behold, a locust, and it's Gog, the king. And uh, for all of you vampire people out there, or vampire-interested people, I hope you're not vampire people, <laughs> vampire-interested people, the the word vruchos, meaning locust, comes from the Greek verb vricho, vriko, which means to eat greedily. And we all remember the vrikolakas from one of our Halloween episodes. So there you go. There you go. There you I'm go. not now saying that offended. locusts are vampires. I'm saying that they both have this word for eating greedily. I think you may have accidentally offended the vamp curious among us. <laughs> But are they sparkle um, yeah, the vampires? Be the, the, the beginning of the verse in Greek is the same. It's, yeah. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, a swarm of locusts coming early, and behold, one locust, Gog the king. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's no way to get that out of the Hebrew. Yeah. You, yeah. you can go look at the Hebrew. It's, it's, it's not, not translation. Sometimes, you can, sometimes there are places where the Hebrew and Greek differ. And if you know both languages, you could kind of look at the, especially the Hebrew, you could look at the Hebrew and be like, oh, well, they read that this way, right? You like, you could tell, right? Or they, th this word could mean two different things. They, 
chose this other one, right? Um, you could find a lot of those things. Um, heck, I'll give an example. The uh, There's a place in the book of Jonah where uh, in the Hebrew, uh, when the the guys on the boat in the storm ask Jonah who he is, he says, I am a Hebrew. Right, which is Ivri in uh, in Hebrew. That's how you say Hebrew in Hebrew. Ivri. <laughs> and if you look at the uh, the Greek there, they ask him who he is, and Jonah says that he is Dolos uh, Kiryu, servant of the Lord. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Those don't look like at all, unless you know that Ivry and uh, Evid, right? Evid is servant or slave in Hebrew. Uh, Evid Yah um, look almost identical in Hebrew if you don't have vowels. Um, the only real difference is that. Translating it as Hebrew means that you see a resh there, an R sound. And translating it as servant of the Lord means you saw a dalit there, which makes a D sound. And the difference between a resh and a dalit in Hebrew is literally a little tiny leg sticking out of one letter. Right. So... It is, there aren't two letters that close to each other in English that I could use it as an example. <laughs> it's like a tiny little piece. Um, so uh, you can figure it out, right? Um, but there, there is no figuring out Amos 7 verse 1. Yeah, it's, the, the word Gog is, Gog the king is, is, yeah, it's just not in there. Gog is not in there. Yeah. You have the king's mowings, so you have king in there, right? Right. But Gog is just inserted, right? I am aghast and agog that they would insert that word. <laughs> As the king of the locusts, right? Which means the, the only way that can get in there is if it was sort of common knowledge to the translator that, oh, this is talking about Gog. Hmm. Why would he think this is talking about Gog? Right. Well, there are some other places, right? So remember, Amos is what we call in English Bible usually one of the minor prophets. In historically, uh, Amos is part of the Book of the Twelve. What we call the minor prophets are 12 books, 12 prof short prophetic books that were all on one scroll. Yeah, right. And were considered to be one book. And were commented on by, for example, church fathers as one book. Hmm. So we have like St. Jerome's commentary on the 12. And he goes through all of them, right? Because they were all seen as one book. Uh, and so Amos is one of those books on the same scroll. Right next to it on the scroll is the book of Joel. Right? Meaning... The guy who's translating Amos into Greek also translated Joel into Greek. Okay, so he's no doubt familiar with the text of Joel 2, verses 20 through 25, which refer to, in verse 20, it refers to God driving away the armies of the north. Yep. And in verse 25, it refers to God driving away the locusts. There you go. The locust with army. The same the language. North. So there is this idea of a locust army that comes from the north. Where does Gog come from? With his big army, the north, right? And so the translator is reflecting in Amos 7 verse 1 in the Greek translation, this tradition of understand of, of Gog's locust army from the north, right? Which is how these prophetic texts were being interpreted at the time he did the translation. But there's another interesting thing 
that shows up in some of the Greek texts of the Old Testament that associates Gog with something a little different. Uh, and one of these is in the Greek translation of Numbers 24, verse 7. Yeah, and this is a case where it switches one name for another name, although admittedly they're kind of similar names. Yes, a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Uh, more similar in Hebrew than in Greek. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this is from this passage in Numbers is the middle of, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, uh, Balaam's second oracle. And I know we've talked about this on the show before, this episode where, where Balaam, son of Beor, uh, Moabite folk hero, gets hired to curse Israel. And instead, he keeps blessing Israel uh, and cursing Israel's enemies. Um, and so in the second one, in the middle of it, there is a reference where it's, it's talking about the Messiah who's going to come from Israel and how great his kingdom is going to be. And it says that his kingdom is going to be greater than the kingdom of Agag. Okay. Which G-A-G. isn't, you know, for, for fans of the book of Esther. Uh, yes, Agagai. Yeah, the, the the big bad guy uh, in in that one, uh, Haman is a, is an Agagite, so he's he's from that that group. Right, um, and Agag was the king who the Amalekite king who Saul was supposed to kill, but didn't. Yeah. Um. So this is Agag. There's a reference to the Amalekites to probably the preeminent of the giant clans, right? Sort of the worst of the giant clans or the the example of the giant clans. This is the most well-known king, aside from Amalek himself, of, of uh, the Amalekites. Um, and if there's any doubt in your mind that it's talking about the Amalekites, if you go a few verses later in the same prophecy by Balaam, he goes straight to talking about the Amalekites. So he's very clearly thinking Amalekite when he mentions Agag. However, the Greek has Gog instead of Agag. Hmm. So kind of putting him in the, uh, this guy is kind of a giant sort of category. Yes, right. Yeah. So this is a change that's showing us that, right, by the time you get to the translation into Greek, right, of uh, of the Torah, right? The Amalekites, the literal Amalekites, right? The literal Agag is sort of old news, right? And at that point, Gog is the one who's seen as sort of this anti-Messiah, anti-God figure, right? Um, king figure, right? Of of the nations of the world. Uh, and similarly, Codex Vaticanus, which is one of the oldest, mostly complete biblical manuscripts that we have, along with Codex Sinaiticus. Um, Codex Vaticanus, of course, the Old Testament is in Greek. I say, of course, people may not realize that. Both Sinaiticus and uh, Vaticanus are Greek Bibles, Old and New Testament. Um and uh, so in Vaticanus, in particular, when you go to, which admittedly is one manuscript, but also one of the oldest ones we have, when you go by a lot, when you go to Deuteronomy 3, uh, verses 1 and 13, instead of talking about Og, king of Bashan, it has Gog, king of Bashan. Which... I mean, someone could say, well, that's just a mistake in that case. Yes, it's just one letter difference. But like scribal mistakes is a whole realm of study. <laughs> um, right. Super obscure and niche, but like this is, right. uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I, Why I, would he th think it was Gog? Well, because Gog at the time, at that time, had come to occupy the kind of place. Yeah in, even though I don't like this use of the word, in the Christian imaginary uh, that, had, 
that had previously been held by Og King of Bashan. Yeah, yeah, and and even if it is like a mistake, um, it, it's it's the it's a different it's an uh, an unusual kind of scribal mistake. Um, number one, twice, add right? A letter. Tw- yeah, to <laughs> add a letter. Usually, like you, scribal mistakes, people leave a letter out. Um, or they get the wrong wrong letter, or they leave a word out, or something like that. I mean, this is the kind of thing like if you're copying a text, you, these are the kinds of mistakes that people make. Um, but to add yeah. a letter is is a little bit a, a little a lot a lot rarer. Uh, we'll just put it that way. Um, but either way, even there if there are mistake, some manuscripts where it has "og" instead of "gog" the other way. Yeah, yeah. But those right. are more understandable. You dropped a letter, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <coughs> um, and they didn't notice it because Og is a guy, right? Like, yeah, in the Bible, right? So, but so that shows you in the text. This gives us an idea, even if you say it's a mistake. Why this mistake? Yes, exactly. Right? Why add a, a yama? Why not add, you know, a beta? <laughs> Bog, king of Bashan, or a delta, right? Like, if you're going to add a letter, right? Um. So it shows what's going on in the minds of the folks, right? Can, so now moving beyond I, right, I was the just translation gonna, of the text. I was just going to say, yeah. if you added a rough breathing mark instead, he could be the original boss hog. Just put that out there. They weren't being pronounced. <laughs> they weren't being pronounced. Oh, come on. You're ruining my Dukes of Hazard joke. I know. I know. Dang it. Boss Hogg, I'm pretty sure, was based on Texas Governor Jim Hogg, (laughs) who did indeed name one of his daughters Ima. Wow. Wow. Man. Out of pure hate and spite. Wow. So, uh, going outside of the text, right, and its translations, um, places where we find people referring to uh, Gog and or Magog, (laughs) right, sort of now outside of the scriptures themselves. Uh, Josephus refers to Magog. He's referring to Magog in the context of Genesis 10. He never mentions Gog. But in the context of the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, he identifies Magog as the Scythians. Hmm. Which would be roughly part of Romania. Oh, boy. Um... And he also has, Josephus also has a story, not, he does, Josephus does not relate this to Magog, but also in Josephus, he has a story about Alexander the Great having an iron gate that he built to hold back a particular tribe of Scythians. Not in the context of Magog being the Scythians. Right, in two different places. The reason that I bring that up, though, is that when you get a little later, uh, well, a lot later in this case, to the Syriac legend of Alexander the Great, um, now you have this sort of full-blown tradition that Alexander made this gate and put spells and magic whammy on it to hold (laughs) back Gog and Magog. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people love Alexander the Great, but you should also remember that uh, he had quite the religious career. You know, he went yeah. on making himself a, a god king, pharaoh, you know, doing magical spells. I mean, he's deep into all that demon stuff. Big yes. time. Yes. Um, but yeah, so this and the Syriac legend of Alexander is from the early to mid 7th century AD. Yeah. Um. But so there is this magic gate, right, Alexander. But you can see how Josephus had a couple stories that probably ended up becoming the building blocks, mm-hmm. right, of the bigger story, more developed story later on. Yeah. Um, Pseudo Methodius, a little later in the seventh century, um, tells a version of the story where he adds this element where, right, well, this this gate, like, what's it attached to, right? So you can see how these things could develop, right? You've got to kind of then explain. So the story gets elaborated a little more to explain things. And he has the gate being between these two mountains, 
Are these the Bronze Mountains? These are the Bronze Mountains there of the go. North. Yeah. <laughs> that we read about in uh, Zechariah. But in Pseudo-Methodius, the two mountains, like, sort of help out. Because hmm. they, I guess, don't like Gog and Magog either. And they kind of <laughs> uh, move closer together. So they'll have to is put up a gate. So they could they could just get gated off. A magical gate. Um, but here, one of the things you see with this whole gate language, too, though, is remember what we talked about with the four horsemen being kind of unleashed, right, into the world. The idea here is that Gog and Magog are kind of cooped up behind this gate until the end when the gate's going to get thrown open and they're going to get to go cuckoo, right? Yeah, so it's the, the, the restraining image again. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you get into later Greek versions after Pseudo-Methodius, uh, the element that gets added to this story is that Gog and Magog, these folks are all cannibals. Um, Man, straight first, <laughs> it's said that they just eat corpses and babies, which I don't know if that was trying to be like less harsh about cannibalism or not, but <laughs> then they just went full on to just their cannibals. They're werewolves. Um, they're all werewolves. <laughs> right. Well, and you get a giant element here, too, again. Yes, right, right. right. Um, and this whole story about Alexander building the gate with Gog and, and Magog behind it uh, actually ends up in the Quran. Yeah, and one fun thing that I discovered during our prep for this episode is that um, there are some Muslim commentators who identify Gog and Magog as the Vikings. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> the Vikings. Right? So you have this full-blown sort of story by the 7th century, and that doesn't just go away. Right? Um, in the West, obviously, they lose most of their contact with the East, but the story sticks around. The story still shows up in these illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages and in, in universal histories and stuff. Um and it's still around to the point that when Marco Polo went to China and first saw part of the Great Wall, he declared that he had discovered the gate. Nice. Right. He said, this must be the Wall of the East. Where's the gate? Show wow. me where the gate is, where Gog and Magog are behind it. Wow. Um, so it was sort of that firmly set. So you have that tradition, but then you also have uh, sort of like we saw with the, uh, the Antichrist, uh, you see all through sort of Christian history, everybody I don't like is literally Gog. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so sort you like find that. a lot of early Christian writings before Christianity is legal where Rome is Magog and the emperor is Gog. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like how now, you know, on the Internet, Everyone you don't like is Hitler. Yes, <laughs> sort of exactly. Thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so St. Ambrose, you could find saying that the Goths, <laughs> right, were Magog. Um, when the Mongols invaded, the Mongolian invasion happened, uh, they were Magog. Yeah. I mean, it's this uh, overwhelming horde to go ahead yes. and use some Mongolian language, uh, you know, that just destroys everything in its path. Right. The yeah. Muslim invasions of North Africa, they're literally Magog, right? Um, Napoleon was identified as being Gog. Yeah, but he, he is, though. Russia. I, well, maybe. Right? <laughs> um, but you see this similar kind of thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That there's this idea of this eschatological enemy of God, even though you don't get a lot of direct connections between Gog and the Antichrist, even when you have somebody like Napoleon, who people call both things, mm. you don't as much see the two connected together. That's interesting. Um, but it's identified in different ways. And then... Dun, dun, dun. Um, Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey. Who the, finally cracked the code. The late, great planet Earth. One of the literary monuments of the 20th century. <laughs> Monument can be used in many different senses. That's true. 
<laughs> it's true. More like a bollard than a than a monument, it, really. It, it but... does demarcate something. <laughs> That's right. God bless him. Yeah, I mean, I I grew up with this. I mean, I grew up with this stuff. Like Gog and Magog, is the Soviet Union. Like that was, that was the whole shtick. And yes. the world was yes. going to end 40 years after the establishment of the modern state of Israel, which means, you know, <coughs> when you and I were about 13 years old, yep. uh, 1988. I have survived a number of ends of the world. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he has this whole, I mean, it's been a while since I looked at this, but he has this whole linguistic and garbage etymological argument <laughs> about how he claims yes. like to Rosh know. Rosh is Russia, Bishak is Moscow. Yeah, right. Man, it just hurts to hear it. Bad etymology. It's just like it's not just wrong, it's aesthetically offensive. Yeah. yeah. And this and this it's wasn't disgusting. just I mean Hal Lindsay is the one who brings this to the forefront, but this was the just considered to be accurate in a lot of the dispensationalist yeah, world. Yeah, there are a it lot. Still of, is, frankly. Jack yeah. Nippy to the day he died was saying that. Oh yeah, I mean there are a lot of people who who really believed, you know, that the Russians, which of course at, at that point meant the Soviet Union, um, that they are this eschatological enemy of God, and the end of the world is is nigh, and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean it's. I, I always tell people, like, look, if you're going to identify somebody as Gog and Magog or, or if you're going to identify somebody as the Antichrist, you need to have an eschatological exit strategy for, for when that person or country or whatever kind of goes off the scene, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it didn't stop Jack. I mean, Jack just kept, you know, uh, Putin's still KGB, he'd say. and you know, No one like, actually did what you're supposed to do biblically to prophets when it turns out that they were wrong. <laughs> Well, I'm there, not saying anyone fair, should do that. <laughs> to be fair to our Pentecostal friends, they argue that uh, prophecy is just now way less reliable than it was in the Old Covenant. No. Oh. They could get the only example of something that got worse and more ineffectual. Huh. How about that? So, yes. I don't know how that works. I mean, I really, I, I can't do better than that, guys. I'd love to steel man your argument there, but it really doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> uh, Holy Spirit gets poured out on all flesh. It's the same Holy Spirit that was in the prophets of the Old Testament. But now everybody can prophesy badly. <laughs> we love you, I, Pentecostal friends. Yes, yes. Like, but I just, I can't, I don't, I can't figure out a way to steel man it. I can't, I, that, I just don't, I don't get that hard. That makes sense to me. Dog don't hunt. All right. So there's a big battle at the end, right? It involves Gog and Magog. Magog. Yeah. 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 And this is the other place where Gog and Magog are explicitly mentioned in Scripture. This is, of course, in the book of Revelation. Yeah. Revelation and, chapter 20. And it's no longer Gog from Magog as it is in Ezekiel. It's now Gog and Magog. Yeah. So two figures. Um, yeah, so Revelation... Well, or? Well, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> so Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Yes, so I don't think it's necessarily the case. I think God can still be a person and Magog can still be a place in what you just read. Oh, in, in terms of like, using the name to designate the people from that place. Right. So you, well, no, so you have Satan. Okay. Right. He goes to deceive the nations, plural, that are at the four corners of the earth. Oh, sure, yeah, Gog and Magog. So Gog could be referring to Satan and Magog to the nations. Oh, oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, one thing that's notable for me here 
in this is it says, and the devil who had deceived them, right? So obviously there's two potential sets of them that this could refer to. There's the saints. Well, he didn't deceive the saints. <laughs> they're, they're doing well. Uh, it's, it's, you know, these other nations that have been brought up against the saints, they're described right. in this as having been deceived. They're victims yes. of the devil. Yes. Yes. So is then I, I would say in Revelation there that Gog is actually the prince of this world. Mm. And Magog is, you know, the nations of the world. Um, so it's still kind of Gog from Magog. Sure, right. Uh, but yeah, so this is we have this kind of final battle. Uh, we've talked before on the show, and I know last time I brought this up, it was a while back, but people got triggered, so get ready. Um, <laughs> and no, I'm not talking about the fact that your favorite pasta dish is a damp tortilla cut into strips. Um, <laughs> wow. What I am talking about Man, there's is the, that, the pasta uh, thing again. People are going to get super <laughs> triggered. <laughs> stir the pot. Yes. And there's not pasta in the pot. Anyway. Um that Armageddon does not refer to the Valley of Megiddo. It's a Greek transliteration of Har Moed. Because Moed, the A there, is an uh, iron. Right. Um, and Har Moed is the mountain of assembly. Right? The mountain of God, which is attacked by... Who in the Old Testament? Amalek. Yep. The Amalekites laid siege to the throne of God. And that was and that was at Mount Sinai. That was sort of the archetypal. That's what made Amalek and the Amalekites sort of the archetypal enemy, even among the giant clans, right? And so the imagery that we get in Revelation is similar, right? That Gog assembles the nations of the world. Right, Persia put right all over the place, right? Gathers them all together to face off against who? Remember our Greek tradition in Balaam against the Messiah and his kingdom. Right? The Messiah being the one who rules from the mountain of God. Right? So this is a parallel there. And so the use in Revelation, I would argue, is another paralleling of Gog from Magog with this, with this tradition, mm. right? Um, and with the giant imagery, right, we can say, is Gog here the devil himself? Is it a human sort of motivated and acted on and through by the devil, like, say, Judas? Uh, is it, right? And the answer is yes. Sure, right. Right. Um, is this a radically different figure than the Antichrist? No. <laughs> right? Um, is this the final Antichrist? I mean, kind of. Right? <clears throat> so, in the end, that's who Gog is. Gog is the final, the final enemy of God. Gathering and motivating the nations of the world to oppose and rebel against him. And to attack and seek to destroy his people. Hmm. Uh, so you could say it is the last and ultimate giant clan. Huh. If you're somebody who gets excited about giants. There are people I've heard. Uh, in the time of the end. Yeah. So if you're one of the are the Nephilim coming back people, this is where I would go if you wanted to argue yes. Hmm that something like that would happen again at the end. That's how bad it would get. Um, this is where I'd go. Yeah. Well, to wrap up this episode, this eschatological episode of the Lord of Spirits, um, one of the questions that um, I think is paramount really like it's the main thing we should be asking um as we look at the scriptures as we read the teachings of the fathers as we listen to experience and participate in the divine services and and so on and so on um the, is 
what is the purpose of this within the Christian life, right? Um, I know a lot of people were had a lot of anticipation for this for this episode of, of our listeners, or and even for other parts of this series. Um, you know, because it's really, I mean, it's some very interesting stuff, right? It's it's really just intellectually stimulating. You know, the four horsemen, the antichrist, all this kind of stuff. Um, it's it's uh, very very uh, intriguing. Um, and, you know, it's good, like, to be intellectually stimulated and to be intrigued and to be interested and to want to know and to understand and explore and, you know, play with and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, again, the point is, why is this given for us, right? The scriptures are not written for our intellectual curiosity, even though I'm a big believer in intellectual curiosity. They're not written for that purpose. The tradition of the church in general is not given to us for that purpose. It's given to us, all these things are given to us, so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing in him we might have life in his name, to use the words of the Apostle and Evangelist John. So then what do all of these bad guys of the apocalypse Right, the four horsemen, Gog and Magog, and of course the accompanying swarms of locusts. What does that mean for us in particular? You know, it's not just about being right or wrong about these things or having an, um, a colorful depiction of the end. It's about what do we do with that? And I think there's a number of things that we could say about that. One of the themes that we've talked about a number of times on the podcast is this theme of what we call the left hand of God, um, to use some of the language that you see in the, the books of Kings, um, where there's the elect, the, the obedient angels at the right hand of God, and then the disobedient at the left hand, meaning the demons, and how they, while they do their own will, they end up doing God's will. I and mean, we talked that about that a bunch of times in this episode, especially that the, the four horsemen and these other demonic figures are kind of on a leash, and sometimes they are unleashed, let go, having been restrained, and then, but under limits, and then brought back, that kind of thing. Um, and, I mean, it is quite simply so that we might repent. Part of the genesis of this podcast some three years ago was when Father Stephen and I appeared on um, Father Tom Soroka's show, Ancient Faith Today, live, and the question was asked, is the pandemic judgment from God? Right? And of course, we both said, yes, it is. <laughs> Meaning that, you know, judgment is God establishing his justice, and so the pandemic was an opportunity for us to repent. Um, and of course, you know, Reshef, right? This pestilence god is one of the four horsemen involved in any kind of mass outbreak of disease. Um, so there is on that level, right? Suffering and so forth is an opportunity for us to repent, both in our personal lives, right? Our, our own individual personal lives, like my, my participation in the divine services, in prayer, in almsgiving, in uh, active love, in self-sacrifice, all that kind of stuff, but also um, on the larger scale of, okay, how am I helping to make the world a more beautiful, more just, better, kinder place? Like, what am I doing to, to help address the ills of the world? What am I doing to make things right? And it doesn't matter if I was the one who made them wrong or not. If I can, if I, you know, if I see someone near me suffering, it doesn't matter if I'm the one who caused the suffering. Now, I might well have been, might maybe deliberately, maybe through neglect, who knows? Um, maybe just the fact that I'm a sinner has this spiritual effect. But repentance, we can repent on our own behalf in terms of putting our own souls right but also repent on behalf of uh, the world in which we live, putting the world right. And I'm not talking about, you know, like I'm out there to change the world kind of stuff, which 
I don't know what anybody means by that anymore. I'm going to make a difference. Whatever. Okay. It's not bad language. I'm just not sure what it's supposed to mean now. But you can make things better where you are. You can serve the people near you, whether it's your family or your friends or your coworkers or your fellow parishioners. I mean, parishes really should be doing this for the parish and for anyone who comes to the parish, right? But also there's another side to this, which is, like you might ask, like, well, okay, God's unleashing demons again. He's, he's letting them do, like, God is not doing evil things, but he's allowing, he's removing his protection from these evil spirits doing their evil things. Um, what about people who seem to be suffering unjustly? You know, is God saying, you, you're bad, and so you need to, you need to shape up? I mean, we've all, I'm sure, seen or at least heard of some unjust suffering, right? Whether it's mass disease, invasion, um, you know, individual people suffering from, from health, uh, serious health problems, or other kinds of suffering in their life, you know, whatever it might be. Um, why do these things happen? Is God, you know... Is God smacking them down? Is God telling them, you're bad, you know, so get better, right? Not necessarily. I mean, it might be, it might be, but not necessarily. We all remember, and I think we've mentioned this on the podcast before, but it is it is worth repeating. Uh, St. Paul talks about having been sent an, an angel of Satan, a messenger of Satan is often gets translated, but, you know, a demon that uh, that tormented him. We don't know exactly what experience he was having that he described in that way. There's various ideas about that. But he's the one who said that it was this evil spirit. Um, and he asks God three times, take it away. And God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Why would God do that? It was St. Paul, this unrighteous, evil man that needed this in order to shape up. No, he's a righteous man, certainly by this point. One of the holiest people ever lived. But the experience that he had was so that he might gain even more of the grace of God. As God said, my grace is sufficient for you. So that he might advance even more in holiness. Because repentance is not only to undo some bad thing that you did. Or even that someone else did. That certainly is included in repentance. But it is also to undo any imperfection. It is also to advance towards being more like Christ, to become more worthy of being adopted as sons of God. Right? So there is an advancement. Repentance is not just to set things back to zero. It's actually to move positively above that, to grow past that. Right? And the experiences of suffering, demonic suffering that we have are an opportunity for that. Often we are tempted, and understandably so, to say, why God, why? Even Job said, why God, why? Right? Now, he was able to do that without sinning, which is super hard for me. I don't, I don't think I could manage it. But one of the answers to why God, why, I'm not saying it's the only one. I'm speaking in general, not in particular. But in general, one of the answers is so that I might have an opportunity to become holier. You know, it's not only to deal with some sin. It is also to advance in holiness. And so when we consider this um, rogues gallery of demonic bad guys at the end, uh, this is how we should receive this. Not to say, oh, that's cool and weird and whatever, scary. Uh, but, but like, okay, these things are put in front of me so that I might learn repentance even more. Or maybe start, or maybe restart. Whatever, whatever is applicable for me. So um, that's one way that I'm, I'm receiving what we talked about tonight. So I want to build a little off of what 
Father Andrew was just talking about. Um, and he was talking about sort of wrapping our intellect around the shape of life in the world as we live in it and finding meaning and growing in holiness. I want to focus on the fact that uh, you can choose to be invincible. You can choose to live your life in a way where no one will ever be able to hurt you, let alone do any harm to you, let alone damage you. This isn't like a one-time choice that you make. Like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. I'll choose that. This is something that we have to practice choosing over and over and over again. And the way it works is revealed in some of the stories in Scripture and things that we talked about in this episode. One of the examples we used is we read a little piece of sort of the deliberations among Joseph's brothers when they were trying to decide whether to kill him or just throw him down a well and ultimately to sell him into slavery in Egypt. At the end of that story, of course, uh, when they realize that their brother is alive, that their brother now has the power of life and death over them in Egypt, uh, they're terrified, and rightfully so. And Joseph says to them, you meant it to me for evil, but God meant it for good. And by that he means they were trying to do evil to their brother Joseph, but God had brought good out of it. Uh, God had put Joseph into the position to be able to save the lives of his whole family through it. And that dynamic is at the core, of course, of what we've been talking about tonight with these demonic spiritual powers who mean only evil for us. Don't make that mistake. They only want to destroy humanity. They only want to do us harm. But who God allows to, at some times and in some places, to try to do some of that harm in order that he can bring good out of it. And one of the chief ways is, as Father Andrew said, through inspiring repentance. But choosing how we're going to receive things and what we're going to do with them is a freedom that we have in Christ. When we are slaves to sin, the Orthodox Church, we commonly call the sins passions because they make us passive. They take control of us. So greed takes control of you. Anger takes control of you. Lust takes control of you. Uh, laziness takes control of you. Pride takes control of you. All of these things, once they get control of you, will cause you to do things that in another moment, on another day, at another time, you would have thought were unthinkable. But when you're in the grip of sin, you, you start doing them. And so when we're, when we're bound by sin, we're not free. But when Christ has set us free from sin, we now have freedom not to just react. We have freedom not to just be passive. We're free to always and at every moment to be active in the world. And so that means when someone just outright insults me, right? Not remotely trying to offer a morsel of constructive criticism, just outright insults me says things designed to hurt me. I have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. I could choose to give in to anger. I can choose to retaliate. I could choose to receive that insult and have it foster humility in me. When someone offers me something that maybe sideways could be, can take it, could be taken as constructive criticism, I can make the choice to receive it as constructive criticism regardless of how it was intended. I can use it to improve. I can use it to repent or to change or to work harder. 
or to see something I didn't see before about myself or about the people around me or to make something right that I've done wrong. These things can bring me to repentance. These things can increase my patience and my resolve. When I get sick, I can use that too. It's funny how often I pray when I'm sick to be healthy again and how little I pray to thank God that I'm healthy when I'm healthy. I can use it to help me understand my own weakness and dependence on others. I can use it to develop empathy for, for other people who are suffering the same things. That's true even for the most horrible thing that could possibly happen to me. Whatever that thing would be, it's happened to other people and is happening to other people. Other people who need compassion and who need empathy and who need someone to help them through those difficulties. If we become consistent in making those choices, we become invincible. No one can harm us, no one can hurt us. Whatever anyone does to us, no matter how evil, no matter how motivated by evil, ends up working to our good. Up to and including, if we're ready to die, if we're ready to die because we, we've been living our life following Christ, they can't even do us harm by murdering us. You can become invulnerable to harm if we start to practice these things. But this isn't how we've been taught to live our lives, and it isn't how we've been taught to see ourselves. We haven't been taught by the world to eat curses and spit blessings back out toward the people who threw them at us, right? We've been taught to lament how unjust it is that we were cursed. We've been taught that the problem is the world is that I'm a righteous person who's suffering. I'm not a righteous person, and that's not why I'm suffering. But we've been taught to look at ourselves that way. The problem is the bad things happening to me not the way I'm living my life and the choices I'm making and how to receive the things of life. We've been taught essentially to see ourselves and to act and behave as victims continuously. And a victim, being a victim perpetually is the opposite of being invincible. It's the opposite of being unable to be harmed. And so to me, this is the really important the really important practice that we can derive from these things uh, that we've been talking about. Um, there, there's too much of our lives that's consumed by fear, fear of being hurt, fear of struggle, fear of criticism, fear of the opinions of other people. Uh, there's too much of our life that's spent nursing old wounds, uh, there's too much of our life that's spent uh, wanting people to treat us the way our other people or life itself or even, dare I say, God to treat us the way we think we deserve to be treated. Uh, and nowhere near enough time spent uh, turning the way life does treat us to good and getting ourselves into a position where, in and with Christ, we are victorious over all of the troubles that come to us in this life. Amen. Amen. Well, that is our show for tonight. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Um, we didn't take calls this time because this is a pre-recorded show, pre-recorded show, but we would still love to hear from you. You can email us at lordofspirits at ancientfaith.com. You can message us at our Facebook page, or you can also leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash lordofspirits. And join us for our live broadcasts. The next one should, Lord willing, be live on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. The horsemen are drawing nearer on the leather steeds they ride. They've come to take your life. If you're on Facebook, you can follow our page and you can join our discussion group. Leave reviews and ratings in all the appropriate places and uh, share this show with somebody that is going to benefit from it. 
And finally, be sure to go to ancientfaith.com stroke support and help make sure we and lots of other AFR podcasters stay on the air. On through the dead of night with the Four Horsemen ride, or choose your fate and die. Thank you. Good night. And on that cheery note from Father Stephen, may God bless you always. You've been listening to the Lord of Spirits with Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. This is Frederica Matthews Green, and you're listening to Ancient Faith Radio, timeless Christianity, 24 hours a day. I'm Robin Phillips, the Gnostic Buster at Ancient Faith. Did you know that God's kingdom is of this earth? Did you know that the resurrection totally changed history? Did you know that because of Christ's substitutionary atonement, we can build for God's kingdom? Do you know that as we participate in God's kingdom building work, we make the world a better place? If any of these questions surprise you, it could be because you have been unconsciously tinctured with some form of implicit Gnosticism. But that's okay. I used to be a Gnostic, and in my latest book, Rediscovering the Goodness of Creation, I have shared my journey from Gnosticism to Orthodox Christianity. It's a journey I invite you all to travel with me. Rediscovering the Goodness of Creation is available at store.ancientfaith.com. I see thy bridal chamber adorned, O my Savior. Rain in the Desert, homilies from Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral. Father Apostolos Hill, Dean of Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral of Phoenix, Arizona, delivers a timely message in a humorous and straightforward preaching style as he draws from his various life adventures to underscore the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to save and to heal broken humanity. Here's Father Apostolos. The is now half over, you can believe it. And we find ourselves celebrating the elevation of the life-giving cross of Jesus Christ, one of three feasts that we keep throughout the course of the year. The elevation, the exaltation, the procession of the cross, the third Sunday of Lent, the 14th of September, and the 1st of August. And the way that we view the cross is essential for us. It is the way that we ultimately view salvation and God and everything that has to do with our Orthodox Christian faith. So it's not surprising that we see in the West today a great deal of, of reluctance to talk about the cross. And as I want to set forth to you today by using the words of others primarily, the difference between the Eastern view, the Orthodox view of the cross, and the Western view, that is to say the Catholic and the Protestant view of the cross. And beloved, they are truly diametrically opposite views. And it is essential that we come to understand that. It's not a small thing to be an Orthodox Christian, and it's not an easy thing to be an Orthodox Christian in the Western world today. So let's begin. Dr. Evania Cosentino wrote a beautiful book that I am reading now called Thinking Orthodox. I commend it to you. It's something that you ought to read, available in ancient faith. And she describes in there the difference between the Orthodox phronima, which we'd say would be worldview, way of life, our outlook, our ethos, our zeitgeist, a supplyable word, and a Western 
Pronimo. And they are substantially different, particularly where it comes to our view of salvation. So we begin then with Dr. Constantino's deconstruction of the teaching of Anselm of Canterbury, who in 1094 wrote a book, a paper, that would become the basis for how the Catholic and the Protestant world would, and I'd be so bold as to say, misperceive the cross, as opposed to the way that Orthodox Christians from the Holy Fathers and from the tradition given to the church views the cross. So let's begin. She writes, Anselm of Canterbury wrote why God became man in 1094, which began with the presumption that God is just and sin is an offense against God that demands punishment. Humans commit the sins, so a human must pay the penalty. However, no human is able to pay such a huge penalty. Only God could possibly pay such a high price. Therefore, God had to become man. God was incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ in order to die on the cross and satisfy divine justice. That is not the orthodox view. She continues, this view, commonly known as substitutionary atonement, or another way is penal substitutionary atonement, has deep roots and is accepted in some form by most Western Christians. The broad acceptance of Anselm's logic speaks to the extreme legalism and the radical departure from the apostolic tradition that had developed in the medieval West. It is ironic that Anselm's conclusion was so readily accepted in the West. The Catholic Church affirms the development of doctrine, which we do not. The teaching of the Catholic Church that doctrine develops, hence medieval scholars are more insightful than the patristic fathers, and modern scholars are more insightful than medieval scholars. That is the opposite of what we believe as Orthodox. And the Catholic Church holds that the medieval and scholastic theologians understood the faith and expressed its concepts in a manner, again, superior to the fathers. And yet, as she says here, Anselm's theology is crude, faulty, shallow, simplistic, and manifestly inferior to the understanding of salvation among the church fathers. And then she quotes Metropolitan Herotheos Vlachos a beautiful theologian and one that we should be familiar with. And she says that he accurately assesses the fundamental theological flaw in Anselm's theory when he points out that this view, in fact, makes God subject to the laws of necessity. God then requires the satisf satisfaction and propitiation. Thus, the purpose of the incarnation of the world in Anselm's view and that of the Western world, and his sacrifice on the cross was the propitiation of divine justice which was offended by man's sin. He continues to remark that not only is this invalid from an orthodox perspective, but it can even be considered heretical, a point of view that would certainly surprise Western Christians because its theory is so widely accepted. So we begin to see then the challenge between us, between a correct Orthodox view of the cross and a Western view of the cross. This view of sin is rejected by Orthodox Christianity because among other things, it suggests that God is the problem and not humanity. God by nature is free of any necessity and of any self-interest of any egoic concern. Without question, the death of Christ and the cross was a sacrifice and redemption for the human race, but that is the only one model by which we understand the entire plan of salvation. The death of Christ and the cross was not transactional. And substitutionary atonement, I'll say it, heresy is 100% transactional. So then it, there can be no surprise that we see within Christendom today, perhaps small c, that there's always this idea of a transaction taking place. Again, this is not the orthodox view. Continues that the cross was not transactional, nor demanded by the Father, nor necessary to satisfy divine justice. Furthermore, such language is unworthy of God and even blasphemous because it lowers God to the level of sinful humanity. 
Part of us likes the idea of a vengeful God because then our enemies get smitten, right? Like we love to be God for a day, throwing lightning bolts at the people who have offended us in some way. Again, this is not the orthodox point of view. Quoting Metropolitan Vlachos again, it is sinful to describe to God the characteristic features of fallen men by alleging, for example, that God is angry and vengeful. God is not angry nor vengeful. And therefore, that he must be propitiated and appeased. Such an attitude wants to make it appear that it is God who needs securing and not man. But this is sacrilegious. The sinful man who is characterized by egoism and arrogance is offended. We cannot say that God is offended. Consequently, sin is not an insult to God, who must be cured, but our own illness, and therefore we need to be cured. And we'll talk about that in a minute. St. Gregory the Great, in his second Paschal Oration, speaks of this, and he says words here that are very famous, that are quoted frequently. Speaking about how we as Orthodox, how the Apostolic Fathers viewed the cross and the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made to slaughter death on our behalf. And this is what he says. Now we are to examine another fact and dogma neglected by most people, but in my judgment, well worth inquiring into. And then he asks a question. To whom was that blood offered that was shed for us and why was it shed? I mean, the precious and famous blood of our God and high priest and sacrifice. We were detained in bondage to the evil one, sold under sin, and receiving pleasure in exchange for wickedness. Now, since a ransom belongs only to him who holds in bondage, I ask, to whom was this offered and for what cause? And then his famous words, it says, if the ransom was paid to the evil one, then he says, Fie upon the outrage. He'll have none of it. If the robber receives ransom, not only from God, but a ransom that consists of God himself in the person of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross and has such an illustrious payment for his tyranny, a payment for whose sake it would have been right for him to have left us alone altogether. So we see again this broad and unbridgeable distance between the Orthodox view of the cross and the Western view of the cross. And we hear that in the hymnology of the church. They say, then, Father, what do we actually believe? If we don't believe that, that God is angry and vengeful, lest to punish and smite, that we sinned, he was offended, his justice demanded an answer, he could kill us, but who cares, we're going to die anyway, so he sends his son Jesus to kill him to get it out of his system. Does that sound like a God you want to serve? Because it's not a God that I would serve, nor should you. So what do we believe? In the Resurrectional Opolitikian today of Ikos Varis, the seventh tone, we say, by means of your cross, O Lord, you abolish death. To the robber, hanging to his right, you opened paradise. The temptation of the mirror-bearing women, you, the lamentation, you transformed into joy. At the Kathisma for the cross that we sang today in Matins, we hear this, of old the tree in the garden, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the fruit of which Adam and Eve ate and found themselves kicked out of the, of the, of the Garden of Eden. Of, the, of all the tree in the garden stripped us naked, and by its taste did the enemy bring in death. Now the tree of the cross, which for all mankind is bearing the garment of life, was planted upon the earth. And therefore is all the world filled with joy. As we see it revered today, let us, O peoples, cry aloud together unto God in faith, full of glory is your house, O Lord. So we see a juxtaposition between the tree in the Garden of Eden that produced a fruit that led to death, and the tree of the cross planted on Golgotha that produced the, true, the, the fruit that brings us life. So we see then the narrative is one of, of cure, of a disease of a lamentable, 100% lethal toxin and virus called sin, which if we leave untreated in our lives will kill our soul and consign us to the flames of hell. Yes, 
but it is 100% curable. So let's just do that. That's simple. We'll talk about that in a minute. Continuing our hymnology, the ecos of the cross today. The netherworld below was trembling today, Hades and death before one of a trinity. The earth was convulsing, and the wardens of hell seeing you coward in fear, yet creation all rejoicing with the prophets sings a note of triumph to you, our Redeemer and our God, who now has destroyed the power of death to Adam and to those who were born af after him. Let us shout in triumph and cry aloud, a tree has brought this man back in. Come out, you faithful, to the resurrection. So we see again and again in our hymnology that the cross is that which vanquishes death. Every time we celebrate a feast of the cross, we give you a flower. We don't give you a nail. We don't give you a writ of commutation of your sentence. This is not a penal institution. That was the early heresy, corrected when the church said, no, this is a hospital. It's a hospital which is cured. And the means by which our cure is effected is the cross and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. How then do we embrace the cross? This all sounds very theological, I have no doubt. There's more I'd love to read for you. I don't have the time. How, though, do we embrace the cross? Because it's not enough for us to say that Christ has destroyed death so I can go about my, very, my merry business and never give it another thought. The cross is a weapon. It's a weapon that we use to slaughter not only death in the sense of an existential category when we stop breathing, but the death that resides in each of us. Again, Ezekiel the prophet says, the soul that sins will die. St. Paul says, the wages of sin is death. How can we then kill death within us but by the cross by using it as it is intended as a weapon in our arsenal to help us defeat the death that resides within each of us through sin how do we appropriate the cross beloved we don't need to overthink this we're in the middle of great lent we're in the middle sunday of great lent when it's become hard when we don't like it when we've gone through our lenten recipes already Maybe we've even come to a few of the services. Maybe we're trying to do our prayer rule at home, reading the daily scriptures, and we don't like the fact that we feel constrained somehow or obligated somehow by this expectation that this ought to be a special time for us. But it is in great Lent and in the auspices of the church that our flesh is subdued by the power of the cross, by not being self-directed by bending and shaping our will to the will of God in simple ways, by keeping the fast. I said yesterday in the Bible study, Christians that don't, Orthodox Christians that don't keep the fast will find themselves with very little to offer when temptation comes because their flesh is untamed and they are self-directed. And they'll say to themselves, I don't need to follow the fast to be a good person. And that's 100% correct. If being a good person had anything at all to do with being a Christian. Beloved, we appropriate the power of the cross as that which slaughtered death on our behalf by the simple, seemingly insignificant things that we do in our lives that show the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We cannot call him Kyrios if he's not really the boss. We can't validly say Kyrie eleison if there are parts of our life that we're withholding from his lordship. The cross is the implement by which God destroyed death. And it is essential for us to understand what the cross does and does not mean. Because once we see it through Eastern eyes, then we will have no further hesitation to run to confession. Because unlike the Western Church, you don't come to confession to be judged, to be condemned, to be told that you're unworthy. Of course you're unworthy. We're a human being. We're never made worthy on our own merits. The Western Church speaks of merits. We do not. Our worthiness resides in the one to whom we are united through the incarnation by the sacraments of the Church. 
and by the daily living out of our lives as Orthodox Christians. So, beloved, today we celebrate the Holy Cross of Jesus Christ, but we do so in an Orthodox way, which again, doesn't it show us an angry, vengeful God who had to kill his son to get it out of the system? But God of love and the one who voluntarily ascended the cross. It wasn't nails that held Jesus to the wood of the cross. It was his love and his desire to save us and to redeem us. So, beloved, as we celebrate the cross today, let us do so then with joy in our hearts, knowing this great treasury that had been given to us in the church. Rain in the Desert. Father Apostolos Hill is Dean of Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Phoenix, Arizona. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. On the web at ancientfaith.com. Healing the unresolved, putting the past in the past. Father Joshua McCool guides those who have suffered painful experiences and continue to live in shame and isolation as a result of these hardships. Father Joshua is the author of Healing Your Wounded Soul, Growing from Pain to Peace, and also Healing Work, Giving Humanity a Second Chance, both published by Ancient Faith Publishing, and is also a licensed counselor in the state of Pennsylvania. Here he is with today's program. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Healing the Unresolved, Putting the Past in the Past. On today's episode, uh, we're going to be responding to uh, a very interesting question, uh, and one that's uh, very different than one we might expect or anticipate. And the question uh, we're going to be answering in this episode is, are there any movies that are recommended that might be helpful uh, in the healing work or in the healing process. And I would begin by uh, answering that question. Uh, certainly, uh, yes, there are. But for each person, uh, the movie is going to be different. And really what we want to look for are uh, what are movies that resonate or even uh, a movie that has a certain part or parts that maybe resonate with us. And most of us have, have experienced this when watching a, a movie. Uh, to resonate means, if something resonates with us, it means that it affects or it appeals to us in a very personal or emotional way even. That uh, even on a deep unconscious level, we very much connect or relate uh, with the scene that we are witnessing, and it can often uh, provoke a very powerful uh, emotional response in us. And most of us have had those moments of resonance where something resonates with us very deeply. Uh, and often those are, are good moments. And so we're looking for movies that, that resonate with us or maybe that even have certain themes. And certainly there's some, you know, certainly feel-good movies out there that, you know, are kind of warm and fuzzy and make everybody feel good. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about uh, movies that maybe have a much more powerful or deeper theme to them that are connected and related to the more common uh, life experiences uh, that we have and that most of us could relate to. And so uh, what, what happens is, uh, so when there's a movie out there or even one scene from a movie that just resonates with us, you know, it's one of those moments where we're sitting watching this movie perfectly fine and then all of a sudden it's, it just gets right through to our heart and could reduce somebody even to, uh, to just this teary mess. And I think most of us could, can certainly uh, relate to that. And so when that happens, if and when we have had that, that experience where some part of the movie just grabs us, uh, what's happening is that the, the imagery or the scene or the life experience we're watching play out in, in this movie, uh, it is bypassing our conscious mind and it's, going, it's tapping right into our unconscious mind. And it's bringing out emotion directly from the unconscious mind. And so in essence, uh, when we have this experience, it is bypassing our defenses. So many of us have uh, defenses that we're employing on an unconscious level to hold 
certain uh, negative emotion at bay. But those uh, defenses are usually guarding us and what experiences we have and maybe protecting us from feeling uh, certain emotions that might be uncomfortable or even overwhelming. However, we might notice that if we watch somebody else have an experience or we hear someone else share a story or we witness a scene in a movie that just gets us, that just resonates, uh, the defenses are not activated because it's not about us, because we are not the source of that uh, or experience. We are seeing it in someone else. The source is not ourselves. And so it just blows right through our defenses and it brings up that emotion that's been all backed up and it gets it up and out. And so from that perspective, that's a very positive thing. And so in fact, this question is really an excellent question. So move, uh, certain movies could actually be, be very helpful in the, in the healing process. Okay, because when we have this uh, experience, it feels good, like liberating moment. And so once we have that moment and we're like, wow, what just happened? What was it about that scene that resonated? What did it remind me of? Uh, once we identify this, it can become a very uh, a useful uh, tool. And so very often what's happening is that movie or that scene is capturing our life story or some aspect of our life story, such as the story of a, a specific uh, life experience. And, uh, and so we can use these moments or discoveries to kind of leapfrog ahead in our own healing work. And that's because uh, these moments of resonance can help us capture uh, a, a certain theme to our life or experience, uh, perhaps that we had not yet been able to articulate up until that point. You know, we, sometimes we just have general themes or a hunch or a vague uh, inkling that it's something to do with this. But sometimes if we follow and track those moments of resonance when something resonates with us, especially in a movie um, it can often lead us to our core experience and enable us to actually articulate it in a very succinct and concise way uh, that is, uh, which helps it feel more manageable uh, and, and more easily to address because it's not like this vague, free-floating uh, experience that we know is out there but can't quite articulate it, right? And so these, these moments, too, they help us to find ourselves. You know, sometimes when people are holding back a lot of emotion under the surface, they can start to feel emotionally numb. And, and our emotions get repressed and they get suppressed and we just numb out because we, we might not be very good at selecting out certain emotions. So basically, in order to suppress certain negative emotions, we tend to just suppress all emotion, sometimes even the positive emotion. Because for some of us, it's hard to feel positive feelings without letting the negative feelings out. It's very hard to hold down one part of our emotional world while letting another part out. Uh, it, it's usually too much to control. So very often people will experience emotional numbness when they are suppressing or holding back a negative emotion. Maybe they're just not ready to deal with it. Maybe it's overwhelming. Maybe we have a hard time tolerating negative emotion. Or maybe we're just tired uh, and not ready uh, to, to deal with it. But these moments can help us find our starting point uh, to resume the healing work if indeed we had gotten distracted from our healing work. Sometimes it, it, just one single part of a movie like that or, or one movie could just totally uh, refresh us, uh, remind us of our core experience and, and re, uh, kind of re-reveal to us uh, our starting point. It brings focus, a sense of where our emotions are, are coming from. That's how powerful and telling and revealing uh, these moments of resonance can be. And so what are some uh, movie examples even that, that you know, maybe have uh, very powerful themes to them that are not just pure, you know, thrills and entertainment, and certainly that even really don't have any violence in them. Uh, so there's a number of them. And, uh, and again, there, there's so many more out there, but I, I just chose a few to use a special example. Certainly this list uh, is not uh, exhaustive in any way. 
So I wanted to start uh, with a mo an old movie. It must, this must have been back from like 1990 or something. Uh, that movie, A Field of Dreams. And many of us, when we reflect on that movie, it's, oh, that, that's that uh, baseball movie with Kevin Costner in which uh, this farmer, you know, just creates this baseball field in his, the middle of his cornfield, and all of a sudden these old-time baseball players appear and start playing baseball again. Of course, uh, for anybody who's familiar with the movie or that watches the movie, you'll see there's a much deeper meaning uh, in that movie that might resonate uh, with many of us. So that whole movie, Field of Dreams, is about uh, unresolved grief. It's about second chances and closure. And so uh, to kind of relay this universal experience that we all have, you know, issues of loss and unresolved grief and sometimes uh, second chances and uh, closure, is, uh, it, it presents Kevin Costner as the main character, you know, this father who's at midlife. Uh, he's kind of having some financial problems. He, and he's starting to feel like his father uh, before his father passed away. And uh, as the movie goes on, uh, it, it's not till the, the genius of this movie is that it's not revealed until the very end, the very emotional ending, what brought about this miraculous field of dreams where all these people show up who had lack of closure in their life to get second chances, whether it was to play professional baseball again or whatever it was. And so at the very end of the movie, it's revealed that it was his yearning for his father. His, he, he, his father uh, died before they could reconcile, and they couldn't connect. And his father tried to use baseball to connect with him uh, and, you know, just wanted to talk baseball with him, wanted him to play baseball. He wanted nothing to do with it. And it actually led to a fracture uh, in their relationship. And so it makes sense that his, this, so of course it's, it's, it's fiction, but nevertheless, it, it conveys a point. Uh, so his unresolved grief, this yearning, led to him to create this baseball field, which was actually an act of grief. It was an act of unresolved grief, trying to connect with the departed, trying to connect with somebody we didn't get closure with. Many of us have done that, you know, in very unique ways. We try to replace uh, lost objects or people, or we seek a connection with them. And so uh, here he, that's why it was a baseball field. Uh, and then at the end, it's revealed that it was his yearning for his father that created this miracle, this phenomenon. And at the very end of the movie, um, you know, all the baseball players are packing up their stuff and leaving the field and disappearing back into this cornfield. And there's one player lingering behind. And he's getting ready to go into his house and he looks. And all of a sudden he realizes it's his father. And it's a very dramatic, emotional part of the movie. And it's when his father was younger, before he had, his father had had all these negative setbacks in his life. He looked fresh and young. And he went up and talked to him. And kind of, they kind of recognized each other. And then they got to have uh, one game of catch, which he would never give his father growing up. And so here, this beautiful field of dreams, which was created by his unresolved grief, gave him this second chance to have a game of catch with his father, that his father, that's really what his father wanted, and he got closure. It, it's such a beautiful theme to it, and, um, you know, it, it, a lot of people don't realize just how deep that movie is and the themes to it. And so uh, that, that scene in the movie uh, is one that often kind of jumps up and bites people and really gets through their defenses and brings up uh, unresolved grief. You know, and when we have been holding back emotion for a long time and something gets through our defenses right to our heart, it, you know, we feel alive again because it's healthy and normal to express emotion. Uh, you know, of course, as long as it's not hurting anyone else, but uh, we're not meant to live like zombies, just emotionally numb and not feeling anything like that. That's usually a sign that we are repressing and holding back a painful emotions. And so uh, another movie uh, that I'd like to take a moment and focus on is also an older movie. And this movie was called Castaway uh, with Tom Hanks. And it was that movie about that FedEx. He was a FedEx executive who, uh, you know, was getting ready to propose to his girlfriend. And then he gets on this plane, this FedEx plane that's flying over nowhere in the middle of the Pacific in a thunderstorm. 
the plane, I think, gets hit by lightning and crashes, has to ditch in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and he's the only one that survives. He gets on this raft and wakes up in this tiny island in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Island. And uh, there are many parallels between uh, his experience, the movie, and the healing work or the healing process. Okay, And so uh, if you haven't watched this movie, watch it. Uh, because each of us has our own island. You know, sometimes when we've had traumatic or painful experiences or losses in our life, you know, it's a unique experience that maybe only we had or that we only experienced as we did. We may have, there may have been other people in our family that experienced it too, but our personal response to that experience is unique. And the healing work that we have to do is unique. And so for each one of us, that experience becomes like this kind of isolated island uh, that we live on, right? And so each of us has our own island that we have to work our way out of. Um, and, and, so, uh, and so in the beginning of the healing work, we have no clue what to do. Kind of like him in the movie. And the, the movie does this masterful job. You can just feel it. Here he is, this city guy who has no idea how to survive in the wild. And here he is just sitting on this beach trying to figure out how he's going to survive. Uh, but then suddenly, uh, as, as the movie goes on, uh, he begins to gain experience and he becomes like the seasoned veteran. He kind of looks like this wild person who's just become this master of living uh, outdoors. And that's what happens to us in, in the healing work. You know, we, once we confront our island, our experience that we're on, and uh, we start to become resilient and we start to become very seasoned and experienced with the ebbs and flows of the healing work and healing from trauma and painful experiences. Uh, and uh, eventually, we might be ready to move on from that island. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, he, he reaches that point where he's finally ready and has all the tools he needs to finally set off to sea into the unknown and leave the island behind. Uh, of course, everybody who knows this movie knows about Wilson. What is Wilson? Wilson is this a volleyball that washed up on shore on this island and he picked it up and he kept it with him and uh, one day he got a cut on his hand so there was blood on his hand and he he must have grabbed hold of the ball and it left this red hand mark on the ball but it looked like a face and so he kind of decorated it more and gave it some features and he started talking to it because he had been alone on this island for so long and so the ball became, he named it Wilson because it was from the, that's the volleyball company, Wilson. And he would talk to this ball, but he was actually projecting part of himself onto this ball. So rather than talk to himself and go mad for how many years he was on this island, he treated the ball and the face on the ball like it was another person, Wilson, who he would talk to. So he would use this ball to actually uh, uh, talk to himself, you see. And, uh, and he had to do that to survive or else he could have gone mad. And so it served a purpose for a time. This was his buddy. He talked to this ball day and night and it helped him survive uh, psychologically. And so the time came where it was ready for him to escape from this island, this place of isolation. And there's a very powerful part of the movie where he finally, you know, he, he had tried to escape on this raft before, but there was a series of waves on this island that he could not get past. Finally, he later in his uh, castaway experience, he found a way to fix this sail to this raft. So when the wind caught it, it pushed him over this giant wave that had almost destroyed him when he tried to escape the first time. And he made it. And he broke free from his isolation uh, and, and being trapped on that island. And it's one of the most beautiful parts of the movie. At one point, he, the camera shows him looking back kind of wistfully and apprehensively as his island fades into the clouds, into the rain clouds, out of view. And he starts to look forward into the unknown, you see. And so his island fades from view, and he kind of looks back at it almost nostalgically, wistfully, apprehensively, and he sails into the unknown to try to rejoin humanity, much like uh, many do who are going through the healing work and... Uh, and, and trying to heal from uh, their own painful and, and, and traumatic uh, experiences. And so uh, there's many more parallels with this movie. And so at this part of the movie, 
uh, there's this whale following him. And this whale kind of just gently follows him and watches him and shows himself once in a while. He observes Tom Hanks, uh, and then when necessary, he sprays him with water to wake him up at very providential times. Uh, and so, um, and then not long comes the real tearjerker part of this movie, uh, which it can really resonate uh, with a lot of people, certainly anyone that has suffered loss in their life. And even if you haven't, it's a tough part for many people. So there's a part where he's sleeping on the raft, and all of a sudden the ball, Wilson, who he has projected part, who helped him survive while he was on the island, that he had projected part of himself onto because he had no one else to talk to, suddenly the ball falls off the raft and into the water. And the whale sprays him with some water, like to wake him up, and he sits up, but the ball, the current has taken it, and he panics, uh, and he starts trying to paddle towards it, and then he jumps in the water, and he starts to find himself between his life raft, which is the key to take him back to humanity and civilization, and Wilson that's drifting away. And he's, he doesn't know which one to do, and he's frantically crying for Wilson. He grabs the rope that's attached to his raft, and he tries to pull it along to go after Wilson, and, he, and all of a sudden he, he can't, and he like starts to drown. And he had to let go. He had to give up something that he had been using to cope with his painful, this isolating experience. And it's, I, I think it's probably one of the most emotional part of any movie. Um, and he had to let Wilson go. And finally, he chose to go back to his raft, which was his only hope to get him back to civilization and rejoin humanity. And then it shows him adrift on the sea, just sobbing and weeping because he had to let go. He had to let go of something that soon he was not going to need anymore because he was rejoining uh, humanity. Uh, and uh, it's very hard, I think, for many people to watch that and not get uh, teary-eyed. But for, but for uh, those of us who have suffered loss in our life, even a life stage transition, so we're not even just talking about trauma here or painful life experiences, but even just a stage in our life where we have to let go of something. And uh, many times as we're adjusting to a loss, we, you know, we have a hard time letting go. We, we try to hold on to things or we, we're doing things in our life maybe that are not healthy because we're not moving to the acceptance stage. And we reach this point where we suddenly realize we have to let go. Maybe it was a stage of life. Maybe it was someone who passed away. Because if we don't, we're going to drown. We're going to drown and we won't survive. And we have to let something go. And we accept the present and start to move towards the future. And that movie just captures that. Um, and that, that's a, a part of a movie that often resonates in a very profound way. And so if we, you can even probably YouTube that clip, but I, I would encourage you, uh, the, the, the castaway Wilson part, uh, but I, I would encourage you to watch uh, the movie uh, because it's, it's just, it's a moment of, of profound uh, grief. And so... Uh, anyways, and so the whale, in many ways, almost kind of represents God in our life through the healing work. So if you watch that movie and you see how the whale kind of cautiously follows him, keeps an eye on him, and almost intervenes when he needs to. For example, when the rescue, when this huge boat's going by, it would have missed him. So the whale sprays him with water and it wakes him up. So he sits up and the people on the boat see him and he gets rescued. And I just realized I totally just spoiled the movie. So, um, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> so I can't take that one back, so my apologies for that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I have to believe most of you who um, are hearing this have probably watched the movie. So, uh, so the, anyways, back to the original point. The whale is like God in our life. As we go through the healing work and the healing process, God follows us. He keeps an eye on us. He lets us do the work and figure things out. But he stays with us, keeps an eye on us, and when he needs to, he intervenes when we need it the most. You see, so there's just so many beautiful parallels by that movie Castaway between the, the movie story and our own healing work and healing experience. And remember, that, so that isolated island is like our island of emotional experience that we often find ourselves on uh, due to painful or traumatic uh, experiences.
And uh, so uh, another program we might watch, um, and this one uh, is that a little different now. Uh, this one is actually uh, not fiction, but nonfiction. Uh, it's a historical, it's a World War II series called The Pacific. And um, it's really for anybody to watch. It's very powerful, a uh, very well made, uh, kind of like that series Band of Brothers, but this one was for the Pacific Theater in World War II. And it's, it focuses around, there's a number of main characters, but there's especially one main character, and it, it is this young man named Eugene. And um, uh, he kind of becomes the prevalent character as the, the series goes on. And he was just, uh, you know, a boy when he goes off, to, like so many of the young men were in World War II, but they came back men, and they, it was hard to adjust uh, to, to normal life. You know, they, they left from high school as boys, and suddenly, after four years of war and horrific experiences, they come back to their bedrooms that they had left from high school, and their sports pennants are up in their books, and they, they just can't relate or connect. And sometimes our painful or traumatic experiences in our life can do that to us. And so in episode 10, so if you don't want to watch the whole series, which I don't blame you if you don't, uh, if, if you have a, an interest in history, I would encourage you to do so because it makes the ending all the more powerful and resonates even more. But if we don't want to, um, maybe go to the end of episode 10, the final episode of the Pacific. And there's actually, you can YouTube uh, this video clip. I think if you put the Pacific ending Eugene. Um, and so this character, Eugene, uh, you know, he's just this battle-hardened veteran. He turns into a man during the war. And, um, you know, you're used to seeing him with his helmet and his, his rifle and his, 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 his uh, uniform. And suddenly he comes home. And uh, to his home state of, uh, it might have been, why do I think maybe it was Alabama? I'm not sure which state it was. But nevertheless, it's a true story. And he wrote a book uh, and uh, about his experience. So his father uh, was a physician, and his father knew he was suffering from post-traumatic stress, basically, because um, his father had treated uh, shell shock survivors from World War I. And uh, so his father took him out one day to try to connect with his son. Um, this is how this series ended. This epic 10-part series ends with this moment. Um, and um, he takes him hunting uh, to go hunt pigeons or doves or whatever, uh, down near this creek, and so they drive up in the pickup truck, and and he looks like a boy. He doesn't look like a man anymore. He's wearing civilian clothing, and he's with his dad, and he's kind of moping behind behind his dad a little bit, and you know, and so uh, he's walking. His dad's walking ahead, and for the first time since the war, he finds himself carrying a firearm, walking through the wilderness, and that was it. Up until that point, he could not show any emotion. He was stuffed up. All his emotion was repressed and suppressed from the war. He had all these powerful losses, horrific experiences, and they were bottled up tight. And all it took, and this is a true story, this happened in his life, all it took was this one experience and it all came out. And it's one of the most beautiful uh, movie parts I think I've ever seen. And so he's walking and all of a sudden it's a trigger and it just, he collapses, and he starts sobbing, and so he's a little boy again, and here this, this battle-hardened adventure that you watch through the series suddenly just crumbles, and his dad holds him and embraces him because he knows what's going on, and he says to his dad, I'm sorry, dad, I can't, I can't, I can't do this, because it reminded him too much of his war experience, and it was just such a, a beautiful, tender moment, um, and so for people who are watching that, to get to the point, um, if they have had uh, traumatic experiences in their life where they just have a hard time, you know, people understanding or or connecting with others or feeling isolated or um, that, I don't think I need to say anymore. If you watch that part, you'll, you'll know what I'm, I'm talking about. It's one of those parts that just grabs hold of our heart. And, it, and if it resonates with us, go with that a little bit. Ask us, what, what, what's the parallel? What's the theme? What does that remind us of? And so sometimes watching uh, movies that show other people's losses and in, 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 uh, in their grieving process helps us, you see. Uh, and so 
Um, this is um, this is just a few suggestions. Uh, finally, you know, there's some other movies I won't go into detail. Another one I recommend is the movie uh, Awakenings, and that that one maybe is not so uh, resonating as the others, but it's it's a powerful movie because in the healing work, uh, we are like those people. And the uh, the movie Awakenings is a true story about uh, Robin Williams. It plays the role of uh, he's either a neurologist or a psychiatrist. I think he's a neurologist at a hospital in the Bronx. It's a true story. And back in like the 20s or 30s, there was this encephalitis that went around. It was contagious. And people went into these catatonic states for years, decades. And he had tried playing around with this medication that in the summer of 1960-something, all the people in this ward that took this medicine had an awakening where they were alive again and interacting. And, uh, but then after a few months, or the, the, the effects of the medicine wore off. But for those few months, they were alive again. And um, it's a very powerful movie that resonates uh, with us because it reminds us uh, to, uh, to use the time that we have to stay awake and do the healing work. Uh, and I won't say any more about that, because, but that's another one I would suggest. And, and many of us who are listening to this could, I'm sure, add uh, to movies uh, that they know of that resonate and that sometimes when they watch it, it helps refresh them for the healing work, the healing process. It helps bring them back to where they need to be so they can resume uh, doing all the work uh, so that they are doing. So yes, to answer the question, uh, movies can be helpful uh, in our healing work. And, um, and sometimes if we're feeling emotionally stuck, if we're feeling emotionally numb and we need something to get those emotions flowing again, put that movie on. Or watch that certain part of a movie, uh, because remember, we're tricking our defenses. Sometimes our psychological defenses want to protect us from negative emotion, so we, can't, we try to feel the emotion and we can't. But if we see it in someone else, or we watch it on the screen, the defenses are not activated because the source of it is not us. It's something else or someone else, and, that, and it, and it go, cuts right past the defenses and brings up that emotion, so we can get it up and out and feel alive again and not flat or emotionally uh, numb. And so that's just uh, uh, one of the ways uh, the, the movies can work uh, and help us. So I really, I, that was a, a really, uh, all the questions that have submitted, of course, have been excellent. So uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, the, the today's uh, podcast episode. And again, uh, if you haven't uh, read the two books that are out there, please do. I, I'm really seeking feedback on the second book. Uh, so if, if you've read it, please consider doing a review on you know Ancient Faith's uh, uh, website or any of the others where it's, it's being sold. Uh, so it's just, just hoping to hear that um, it's, it's helped uh, people out there. I know it hasn't been out too, too long, but if you have a moment to do that, I'd be grateful. All right. Have a blessed day and... We'll be back soon for the next episode. Healing the Unresolved. Putting the past 